out and stuff and you can snip in editing but it's all kind of just a pain in the ass so i haven't done that i basically just jumped straight into the streams and who cares about the live viewership right but um uh for a lot of those opening scenes uh mr modius did some amazing work with some of the previous expansions i just hosted on wp2 his recent one for secrets of the obscure this poor guy has been trying to get me to put this onto uh wp2 since like the start of the expansion <laughs> Find this up. So I want to show you guys the uh, the video, and it's about a minute long. So hey, for people watching the VOD, you can enjoy it, or you can just skip ahead for that one minute. But I do want to show it off. We'll have it in the background as well for some Q and A and discussion, which I'm going to do in a second. So uh, yeah, um, I'm going to show you guys that, and I'll see you in one second. So yeah, the, the full video clip, I mean, how amazing is that, right? The full video clip is about uh, two minutes long. I've given you one minute. If you go to Wooden Potatoes 2, you'll see the full thing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they're, they're awesome. He's been making them for a while now. We had an End of Dragons one. I've actually got an archive of like, all the amazing cool animated art that Mr. Modius has done over the years. If you remember during the End of Dragons era on our like just chatting stream, he had some really cool stuff to do with factions back there. Um, but yeah, okay, so uh, in this video we are going to run through Secrets of Obscure. Now I'm thinking I'm going to do it on Warrior because what I want to do... Um, uh, I know I already checked this, we can start straight away here at the War Council. And what oh, I can do boy. is mute the audio while we discuss things. You see, like a genius. And... Um, in fact, has my warrior even been to Naos? <laughs> he hasn't. It's fine. Look, we can use our new strategy, right? Which is to press Y, go to Seekers of the Obscure, go Rift Hunting. Ah, oh, nobody's in Naos right now. Well, hold on. In a Naos? Yeah, West Meta. Oh, this map's full, though. Because of our amazing new UI. You see, we've got the exclamation mark there. New Meta here. And then we just go TP to a friend. Actual like pay to win stuff here with the uh, TP to friends as far as I'm concerned. Well kind of I'm being a bit ironic because at the end of the day you can get gems for gold so whatever but yeah uh, so there we go we can uh, not only be in the map but we can be doing one of the metas. Which meta are we on at the moment? We're on meta 2 in the north area. Okay that's cool. Uh, so yeah we are going to oh I have Archon as well. That's interesting. Maybe I should turn that off for now. Hold on, let's uh, close this down. I have Ark on because I've been doing uh, Sarah's CM. And, um, yeah, well, we got lots to talk about here. But I guess what I really kind of want to do opening this video is... Uh, I'm going to take us to this screen here. Now, hopefully this all works. You guys can hear me just fine, right? We got the we got the art in the background from Mr. Modius. You guys have to tell me if my volume's a bit low. But in the previous part, I mentioned... You know, we, we talked about a bunch of topics... And I said, hey, guys, feel free to leave comments because I will respond to them. We'll do like a Q&A type thing. Uh, so I, I've actually gone ahead and done that. So let's go through a couple of messages. Now, I was reading a really, really polemic, like grueling thread about uh, Secrets of the Obscure the other day on Reddit. People are not enjoying these patches, I have to say. You know, we, we've really got to be honest about this. Um... But, uh, so, instead of digging through that Reddit thread, which I do think is an incredible read, uh, I've just grabbed a couple of comments off of, uh, the YouTube channel, which hopefully will get us to most of the big topics. So here's the first one, uh, from Etheread, who, on the note of, uh, uh, this season, do we 
call it a season sequence of the Obscure's post patches. The format is explicitly good. The problem is that they aren't just making this reduced amount of content at Path of Fire Living World Season 4 quality. They're reducing the quantity of content and then also cheaping out on production to make room for the shiny new Unreal Engine 5 project that they can't say anything about, which is a huge drain on artistic resources because of the higher fidelity and the fact it has to be a full-blown game rather than just an update. No format other than maybe a scale down to personal story level content that restricts itself to Corteria will ever fulfill its, prom uh, its potential with all this script scrimping and scraping. But even though there are actually a lot of good stories to tell at that scope, like for example the Crichton succession, succession artifact, the fate of the post dragon pact, the Crichton canthus summit, Malik's tree and the pale trees recovery, they can't actually go that far because then they can't even try to pretend that they're full steam ahead on Gittlesea. See, and so I really agree with your comment here. I think that the Unreal Engine project is is a big thing to talk about, as it has been ever since we really heard. And, that, and by the way, they're not pretending that they're full steam ahead on Gittlesea. They have said that they're committed, and look, it was all very corporate, wordy, delicately phrased stuff, right? But that what they've said is that they're committed to Guild Wars 2, Guild Wars 2 isn't going anywhere, and that they still value and favour the game. And they'd be insane to just step away from Guild Wars 2. If you are a company with a successful MMO trying to make another MMO, you're just going to cannibalise your own audience in most cases. It's a really great, you know, MMOs are hard enough to make, and now we're talking about adding even more risk on top. It's it's kind of a nuts prospect. So what they're definitely not going to do is like piss off their existing fan base by saying yeah, it's over. If you look at what they did in the transition between Guild Wars One and Guild Wars Two, where they explicitly said to the community, hey, this is it, it's over, we're moving to Guild Wars Two now. I, that like that's kind of nuts, you know. That's all eggs in one basket, and that in one basket, and that confidence probably put a lot of seats in chairs and gave them a lot of eyeballs but it did also estrange a lot of people i was talking just in um the spud discord last night before i went to bed uh because i'm doing my guild I, did i mention on the previous stream i'm doing a replay of guild wars one at the moment and i'm about to get to lion's arch anyway as i'm playing that game constantly i'm just seeing all these things it's like wow if if we had mod tool, if they remastered the game and released mod tools for guild wars one it would just be the best thing in the world and as i'm playing i'm like oh if i had mod tools i would tweak this and i would tweak this and i would tweak this and i would tweak this oh it'd be so cool like there's a, a billion amazing and interesting things that they could have done with guild wars one but they made the decision to move wholeheartedly off of it. And I think that was the wrong decision, especially looking back now. I wish that they'd kept the live team around. I wish that they'd kept some, you know, serious support going. Obviously, they've had a couple of small updates. Actually, uh, I think the most recent patch note for Guild Wars 1 is kind of a 13-year retrospective or something where they say, hey, look at all these updates we put in without any downtime and stuff. So, you know, there have been little things. I've covered them as they've come out, stuff like the graphics update, the anniversary update. But, I mean, actual real skill balance and little content areas, stuff on the size of the bonus mission pack, maybe real stuff. I wish that they'd kept going with it. I really do. Um, so now we're at Guild Wars 2 looking at some kind of new Unreal Engine project. Uh, I think they will learn from that mistake and I think they'll stay with Guild Wars 2 forever and that's all they said But they're not hiding from the fact the Unreal Engine project exists I mean you, what you say here is that they pretend they're full steam ahead on Guild Wars 2. Do they do that? Do they pretend that they are full steam ahead? I don't know. I definitely get the impression. Let's be very clear That I think the vast majority of them are on the Unreal Engine project I, I really do think it, it's pretty clear that the mini X pack format that this style of post content drops it is to facilitate the fact that probably the majority of the studio is working on something new and shiny that they're excited about and you know i can't begrudge anyone that would be excited about that because like think about it from the perspective of a new hire coming into guild wars 2 um you know you don't really know guild wars you don't really know tyria you've got this venomous nasty wearying draining game community right that are just brutal about everything that goes in really and you have no real attachment to them this is weird i seem to be getting mails in game oh no i died in game interesting okay you guys can't actually hear my game sound effects but of course we're idling in modern content which means millions of mobs ready to tear your face off i suppose that's fair since it is the demon realm hold on i'm currently flying on a sky scale you guys can't see it yeah so um if you're a new hire i i don't think you're gonna be interested in guild wars 2 I think you're going to be interested in in the thing that you can influence from its start. Because I don't know whether this will be a Tyria project. I mean, we've talked about this stuff all the time. I think a Guild Wars 3 is a flat-out terrible idea. I think what they should, what they're probably doing, I don't know. 
Uh, this is so hard. Because one big part of me just wants to scream, if they had gone whole arse on Guild Wars 2 for all these years, if they'd never d d um, dithered about it, if, if ever since Heart of Thorns, it's just been Guild Wars 2, Guild Wars 2, Guild Wars 2. And I don't care what the publisher says or what the shareholders say about how that's a Doom Studio. It's not true. That's out of date. That's an out-of-date mindset. You can have a studio all going whole ass on one MMO. Look at the, their competition at the moment, the kind of stuff that the other MMOs do, and they still have their core audiences. So I, I wish that they'd stayed with Guild Wars 2, but in the event that we are looking at an Unreal Engine 5 project as it is now, or in the event that we were looking at mobile projects, or in the event that we were looking at whatever the hell they were doing around the end of Season 3, where 33% of people very grimly you know, lost their jobs over all that stuff. In the world where we're looking at, we have to do a new project. I don't think it's a Terrier project at this point. I mean, my answer to this has changed month in, month out. But I don't think it's a Terrier project because I think that allows Guild Wars 2 to not compete with it. Whatever this new thing is, it's got to be so big and so amazing and so brilliant um, that if you also make it the Tyrion IP, the Guild Wars 2 IP, it's, you know, it could be this. I don't know if you guys have been following Payday. I don't really pay, pay play Payday. But Payday 2 is like a well-populated game. It gets like 22,000 concurrent users on Steam, like daily. And I think that's probably far more than Guild Wars, just for comparison. Not that like, comparison is really necessary. But they released Payday 3 recently. And it was a better game and a better engine as far as I can see. But certain choices about the progression and the amount of content in it. And this is the key point. There was less content. There were less heists to play. Uh, meant that everyone's just stayed with Payday 2. Payday 3 has like 200 people playing it. Payday 2 has like over 20,000 people playing it. And I think that you could easily expect a similar thing for, for a Guild Wars 3 or another Tyrion project. Even if it's not named Guild Wars 3. So it's just this huge risk. And ArenaNet knew that risk as well, even way back in 2012. They knew that there was this incredible thing where like new MMOs had to compete with these ridiculous feature bases because the point was wow at the time, you know, any new MMO that was coming out in that gold rush for MMOs in the late 2010s, sorry, the early 2010s, the late 2000s, all these businesses, they said, look at all the money that Blizzard are making at WoW, we want a slice of that pie. But releasing against WoW was so difficult because they had all these features already and they had years and years where they'd been building and building. A, a Guild Wars 3 would be competing against itself. So, anyway, I don't know why I'm ranting about all of this, because it's not necessarily uh, related to your comment. But yeah, I think I think there's a huge amount of risk with this new project. I think that, so I think there's a, a huge reason why they should put a lot of people on it, because it, it's such a risky thing to do. Uh, and then on top of that, I can imagine a lot of new guys not even being that interested in the Guild Wars stuff. So then who have you got left for, to do the Guild Wars stuff? Not many, you know, and... Um, you know, the Reddit thread went really, really crazy talking about, you know, weak bosses and why should the employees care if the bosses don't and all this kind of just insane shit. Uh, but yeah, uh, as to this simple idea that they should have told a different story, I don't know. I don't know whether... I, I think that this is wrong. I've seen a lot of people say this, that Secrets of the Obscure is just bad because they've tried to tell too big of a story again. Right, I will criticise this story in as much as it's the same thing over and over and over again we're helping the underdog band of rebels it doesn't really deliver on the demon fantasy as well as we'd want i'll, I'll criticize the story on those grounds but the grounds that this story is too big for secrets of the obscure even a slashed underfunded you know i'm not gonna use the word skeleton crew but you get the idea sort of developed secrets of the obscure post patches uh i still don't think it's too big i think that they framed it too big the essence of this story, let us you could be reductive about any story. You could just say the pale tree. That's pretty reductive, right? You could just say the, the cry in succession. That's very reductive. What you're really talking about there is to get real drama and stakes and intrigue out of this probably is to go back to the cry in civil war style thing, which again is big stakes. So let's be reductive about this. We're just exploring a new dimension. That's the remit of this story. A, dim a dimension filled with demons and have a bit of conflict there. That's all we really need to do. But what they've done with that basic principle is they've tried to go too big they've said oh we gotta have you know they're trying it's that Grothmar thing again you know some people say that um Grothmar was the last good patch and I guess because of the actual gameplay wait did this character even go there oh my god I guess that's because of the gameplay that people say that but come on Grothmar was terrible and one of the reasons Grothmar was terrible is because they were shoehorning a, a char civil war into a storyline that didn't need it 
and in one single patch, all of a sudden, you're telling me the whole war's going on? You know why the searing feels really cool in Guild Wars 1? And believe me, I just played it. It's because it takes a, you spend a long time in pre. There's a lot of shit you can do in pre. You can have a lot of fun. You can get really attached to the place. There's a two-year time jump where everything gets destroyed. Then there's a bunch of missions and time that you're spending in old Ascalon before finally you end up leaving. Then way later in Eye of the North, there's even more. Like, that's one war. That's one conflict, and it's told over a long time. You can't do that in two Living World scope patches. You just can't. And yet they... So that was like a... The core idea in the Icebrood Saga was way too big for what it could do. Here, the core idea is small enough, but they've tried to, like, expand it, I guess, in, in an attempt to get people enthusiastic about it. I don't know. I think there's kind of a weird thing going on with the criticism of the game as well at this point. Um, which is, you know, everyone know We all know in the community that we're dissatisfied with the story at this point. We all know that we are. And it's easy to say, oh, they could have done this, they should have done this, they messed up here, they messed up here. But, you know, we... In some ways, we have hindsight to know where they've gone wrong here, and they didn't have that hindsight themselves. But in other ways, um, you know, it's easy for me to go on the internet and say, oh, it should have been a smaller stake story. It would have been so much better if it was a smaller story. It's very easy for me to say that. We don't actually know that. If they did that, there would still be a bunch of people bitching, and they'd say, oh, this doesn't feel epic. This feel, feels lame. This feels like a fucking Saturday morning cartoon. Where have the stakes gone? Where, you know, what's, what is better? To aspire to a really big dick idea and fail, i.e. what we've got. Or to aim low and try to tell something good. And it's easy for us on the internet to say aim low now with hindsight. But I don't know whether that's really true. I don't know what the proportions, you know, you'd have... You'd have a group of naysayers for what we got, and you'd have a different group of naysayers for if they'd gone the other road. And I don't know, I don't know. Aim low just feels a bit... <laughs> like, I can understand why they didn't aim low. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, not to be too defensive or anything here, but I think it's... It's easy to convince yourself you have all the answers sometimes when you might not necessarily. Uh, let's kill this guy, I guess, here, since we're suddenly doing a fight. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about Ceres, I guess. Um, yeah, so I mentioned in the previous part how, like, <laughs> this is where I'm going to be very different. It's one week, guys, and you're going to hear my commentary is completely different. So last week, I was aware that Ceres CM had come out. I hadn't watched any footage about it. Didn't give a fuck about it. Seriously, I didn't really care. In fact, I saw um, uh, there was a, a, a dev tweet, an ex-dev had tweeted and said, Hey, I'm really, really proud of the team. They've made the best CM ever, and, you know, and I remember reading that and thinking, oh, you know, that's nice that they're being supportive, but, I mean, I really don't care. Who, who cares? That's really sort of how I felt at this point. I was that disinterested in it. Anyway, so uh, the Spuds, uh, so Jones, a massive shout out to Jones, and Derpster a little bit as well. These guys have set up. They've done everything. They got all the people together. They figured out all the strats. They got everyone on the builds that they want. They got everyone together at the right time. Proper, like, full-on commanding. I've done nothing. I've done absolutely nothing. I've been working on my Let's Plays and all the, the mountain of content that you guys are going to see this year. I've just been working away on that stuff. And, you know, I log in to the Spud Discord earlier this week, and they just have everything going. They're using, like, an FF14 raid tool where they've made, like, slideshows, uh, spreadsheets and stuff. Super cool. So, anyway, I got assigned a build. Condi Herald, um, and uh, which I, I'd never played before. I'd never done that rotation. I looked up a rotation online. I practiced it for about I don't know, a very short period of time. The day, <laughs> the day off, pretty much. Uh, went in, and oh, it was really fun. It was really, really, really cool. And I love that. And so now I've actually looked at like how the fight went, and I've sort of followed along with how the prog and stuff went, and. Oh, it, it, is, it is a pretty cool fight. So I don't think it's quite as good as HTCM. Uh, in terms of, like, HTCM really felt like a sort of a magnum opus kind of encounter, you know, with a, a huge amount of moving parts, and all the phases were so different. But there were things that I hated about doing HTCM. I hated the pits of death. And by the way, you can see our complete clear of HTCM. I did a video and a full commentary about it. Oh, I fucked that up. Um, and then also, uh, on Winter Potatoes 2, I think I did an extra video, like a re-clear. Where there was, like, almost no mistakes or something. Anyway, um, HTCM was kind of annoying in some ways. Like, the orb-pushing phases were kind of boring after a while. And, you know, the repeating dialogue, as much as it becomes a bit of a joke, was kind of annoying after a while. And, um, yeah, full counter, baby. 
Uh, and the pit of death. I hated the pit of death in HTCM. So many runs lost just because... Why have I got a ping on me? What have I done wrong here? We're just phasing it, aren't we? Um... Yeah, so uh, so there were things I didn't like about HTCM. This one is just hit the boss, you know. There's no pit of death next to you, and it's just it's just chaotic. It's just a, it's kind of like a normal fight, but really really well tuned. And then in the later phase, there's some very cool movements they ask of you, like where you line up and stuff. So it's just it's really exciting. Miss my uh, X4 there, and um, and it's sort of just I don't know. It's funny. It's the same thing happened last year. Like literally the same thing happened last year. I wasn't playing very much Guild Wars. And then uh, we got into the HCCM stuff, and I just got really into the game. And it's, it's amazing how it cascades out. I've been doing more convergences than I was doing before. Just playing a lot more, and playing a lot more Guild Wars 1 as well. So I've gone from sort of being very, very away from the game to kind of very into it now. Um, yeah, so as far as our progression is actually concerned right now, I know whenever I mention this stuff, people are like, oh, will you stream it? Will you show it? I really don't think it's very good content. I'm sorry. And I'd rather, uh, you know, people just relax without feeling like they're on camera and all that kind of stuff. And myself as well. So basically, uh, what we're doing is, if you guys don't know the fight, there's a... Oh, I cancel casted it again. That keeps happening. I should probably do Dagger 3 first, just so I stop doing that. Uh, what's, what's happening basically with it is... Um, there's a stack mechanic where he keeps getting empowered as the fight goes along. And it doesn't really become apparent until the last 10%, but you really don't want him to have any stacks. So instead of just going through the fight a bit sloppily and letting him get stacks here, that, here and there, we're kind of like mastering the phases. So like, we'll get the first 20% with zero stacks and then start dealing with the next 20% and then do that with zero stacks. And so we're, we're, we're down to like 60% now doing that and we've only met a couple of times. Um, but it's lots of fun and... Uh, there's a really cool other mechanic in it, which is basically you get a bunch of greens all at once, and they need to be groups of three people each time. So you've got ten players, and there needs to be three groups of three. And it's totally random who gets what. So, like, uh, the community seems to have settled on some interesting systems on how to assign people to go certain places and solve that mechanic quickly. It's funny because there's definitely knowledge that people will have learned in other games, like in FF14, their ultimates and shit definitely... Uh, not ultimates, um, what are they called? Fuck, I what they're called. Anyway, other MMO scenes will have definitely had mechanics like this that, you know, people who play those can be here in Guild Wars be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can solve it this way or whatever. So that, that's, it's pretty cool. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, we're not meeting. Well, not unfortunately. Last year, what we were doing was really fast. We were doing, like, two hours a day. If I remember, it was every day, wasn't it? Doing HCCM. This one we're going a bit slower, which is very good because it means that in all that downtime, I'm still making other videos and doing other things. So we're not actually meeting again until Sunday now. Um, oh, oh, was the guy who pinged me in chat. Well, you were just trying to figure out stream delay. Oh, that's okay, man. No worries. I thought I was fucking up or something, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I really have much else to say about Sarah's CM just yet. I'm looking forward to doing it. It does look really hard. And I think it's going to be one of those things as well where I don't know whether I'm on the right build because I was playing a very low intensity build before as well. And it always got to the point where I was thinking I could be I could be doing like a portal roll or I could be doing something more complex. And I sort of wish that I had learned it at the start. But, you know, at the, on the other hand, it's nice to be able to relax and, uh, <laughs> you know, just DPS and put quickness out. The build's quite interesting as well, by the way. It's not as it's not the most fun rotation I've ever played. Um, oh yeah, and then we just have the eye here. But um, I love Malix, and I kind of love the visual of Malix v Ceres, or the fantasy of Malix v Ceres. I think that's really cool. Uh, the other thing is like the visuals in the fight and the intensity and stuff is all really cool. But it's a bit of a shame because the lore is just not connecting with me on any level right now. It's really not. So I look at Ceres, and I don't like when I'm doing HTCM. I, I like feel the weight of the moment in the story, and it's like you know you've got the music and stuff. It all seems to matter and fit. In this, it's kind of like oh yeah, this guy, <laughs> and it doesn't. There's there's really not much impact. <laughs> but the music's good. So that's something. We're gonna get behind him here. No, how am I getting pushed away?
Ah. Oh. It's kind of a thing with Earthshake on this build where um, if you have your mouse over UI when you trigger it, you can essentially fast cast it at your own feet without the ground tell. And it technically would speed up your animations, but I never do it. And there, I often like Earthshake because I like it to close the gap when I chase someone. Um, anyway, we're not going to be playing Hammer or anything here. We're going to be playing with a Staff, which should be pretty cool. Anyway. Wow, we got really sidetracked there, didn't we? That's probably good, actually. Instead of just relentless Q&A, have a little bit of gameplay in the middle. I totally just ended up doing that. Did we get unlocked the first waypoint because we arrived here? Oh, we didn't. We unlocked this one, though. So let's go back to the forward bivouac. And I assume we're safe there. It's not a good idea to totally assume, to be honest, but I will I will do that. Mm. How is my coffee already getting cold? Mm. Without me meaning to offend, how you manage to sustain yourself from YouTube? Some people... Uh, I'll be talking about this in some of the recent uh, Let's Plays that are coming out. My big plan at the moment is really to do a big push on other LPs and other content and stuff away from Guild Wars, which is what I've been wanting to do for ages and ages and ages. And the whole thing really is contingent on um, whether people will stick around for that, particularly on Patreon. Patreon is like everything, and uh, yeah, obviously when I'm inactive and when I'm not doing those projects, it's going to shrink. But um, so it's kind of basically what I'm doing is I'm putting a lot of work in this year and I will see where I am at the end of the year, essentially. But there'll be more conversations about Patreon and all that stuff. Uh, I kind of don't want to mention it for sort of a good reason. And you'll see if you're watching the other LPs, like when we get to the final episodes of those and things. Um, yeah, OK, so let's not get in a fight. Let's go grab a couple more of the questions. And, uh, and let's see what else we've got. So chatting. It's nice to use the chatting screen. I haven't used this for ages and ages and ages. Uh, so which one did we just do? That one? So then we got this one. Samakus so says, oh, Pather is, so on this note of is, is Pather good or bad, you know, is the story any good? Well, we don't know until we find out whether we get betrayed or not. <laughs> oh, uh, Pather is definitely a good guy for Cryptus, and many players already forget how in the first patch of Secrets of the Obscure, demons wouldn't shut up about being interested in Tyrion's emotions and life experiences. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot about that as well. So my guess is that Pather will win and then drop a classic, well, my people need to eat too. Yeah, I'll do the voice, ready? Well, my people need to eat too. There you go. That's how she'd say it in game. So demons will always be in that gray area. Judging by that scene where Commander asked a medic if it's a bad sign to hear demons voice in your head and got a reply, it's okay as long as they don't make you uncomfy or push you to do bad stuff. It may go into occasional parasitic bond of some s sort. Maybe some Tyrians willingly become hosts for chill and nice demons. Maybe even Arena will be the first one to do that. She got friendly enough with Ramses after all. There's enough trust uh, between them to pull it off. And as a bonus, maybe we'll have a small number of opposed Astral Ward Wizards court members heavily disagreeing with this practice. You're talking about Revenants. I don't know if you realize that, but you're talking about Revenants. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm excited about that either. I, I don't think that that's a very good place to go. You know, if uh, we, we, ended, we ended dragons, big world ending threat in the dragons, okay? So now you're introducing demons. Now, you don't necessarily have to power creep the scale and stuff, but I want something cool and meaty to be scared of and fun, uh, you know, and really vibe with. I think that's the thing with Guild Wars. In all the recent stories, with the exception of some Icebrood Saga stuff, i.e. Banger, and, and the vibe of the Icebrood for a while, and with End of Dragons, Anka. With the exception of those things, most stuff in Guild Wars doesn't really feel gritty or serious or... There's just nothing for me to latch onto emotionally with any of it anymore. It's all very surface level, sort of blah, 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 skipping through the fields kind of stuff, it feels like. And that, I feel like the big thing that has upset people about the Realm of Dreams is, is it's more of that, you know. I don't know, maybe there's just... Maybe there are less edge lords like myself out there than I realize. But when I think, oh, we're going to go to the demons, I want kind of like a nightfall experience. I don't want a realm of dreams where we're exploring our emotions. And I feel like a bit of a weird crit, um, hypocrite 
in not liking the emotions stuff in this this storyline because as a mesmer player in guild wars one i loved like the whole emotion vibe on their abilities and stuff but somehow it just hasn't translated to me as i am here today so i don't know this thing of oh we're gonna go here and get friendly demons in the head i'm just i'm not down for that really i don't think it's that excited uh anyway another point uh honestly i should have all i need to pull off enjoyable playthroughs of the games i'm actually of the three that i've done so far and the fourth that i'm working on right now I'm really excited about all of the playthroughs that I've just done. I think that they're high-quality videos. I think they are good. Um, obviously, with Shadow and FF6, the first chunks of them were kind of the live format thing, which I'm not quite so proud of. But, you know, actually, in making those videos, I went back and just listened to a lot of my own content. I very rarely do that, guys. Basically, I make content, I edit it, and I'm okay with it enough to put it up. And then once it's up, about a week will pass, and then it's, like, dead to me. I hate it. I hate everything I've ever made. You know, uh, this is going to sound really presumptuous, but you know you often hear actors are like they can't watch their own movies or whatever. Um, I feel that way with my own... I cannot stomach my own... I really can't. Uh, so I avoid my own stuff like The Plague a lot of the time. However, when it comes to, oh, you've been doing a series, it was a year ago, you need to remember a lot of details about exactly what's going on. Really, you've got no choice but to watch your own stuff and get back into that exact place that you're in. So I've done that with Six and Shadow, and actually I think they're not bad either. You know, they're not, they're not perfect, but even the live formats for those, they're not perfect. Um, yeah, and you really like my other stuff, uh, but you just, you're not into Final Fantasy or Tomb Raider. You really liked Arena and Grimrock? Well, don't worry. I've got lots of stuff like that uh, coming up. So, anyway, thank you. Uh, next question. Keeping it about Guild Wars here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this was an early one. So this is from Nick Last Name. Uh, I 70% agree with you about Naos patches so far. I actually do like Naos lore-wise and the demons, etc. But I definitely agree that we shouldn't have got cut off from our main cast like this. And the story here feels a bit thin and rushed. Okay, let me pause real quick right there. Because I've been, I talked a lot in that previous episode about the whole main cast thing. And I want to put a point on it. Be very clear about what I'm talking about. Obviously, End of Dragons closed the story of the Dragons and also Dragons Watch. It moved those characters to the side. Okay, they have their happy ever afters. They don't necessarily need to come along on the mini X-Pack. One of the benefits of the mini X-Pack formula is supposed to be that new players can come in without having to have done years and years and years of reading and they can just play the game and actually eliminating all the old cast members is fine you want to bring a random back like zodger who people who these new players will recognize from their personal story anyway that's cool you know those characters that appear way back in the personal story i think they're evergreen but these living world season one plus characters yeah maybe sunset them if we're trying to go back to this this new starting point so I think it's fine that Secrets of the Obscure got rid of all of those. Even if the Scooby-Doo mystery gang I was kind of interested in, it's actually okay if we don't see Marjorie and Kazmir and Gorik and Timey and everyone. It's okay. You can move them over. And besides, you know, for every one person that loves one of those characters, there's another person who hates those characters. They are divisive characters, whatever. So, you know, move them aside. That's fine. The argument I want to make specifically about Secrets of the Obscure is okay introduce to me some new characters give me mabon give me lahir give me urchit give me glade and the, uh, they're fairly interesting as well none of them are like anka or bangar level okay none of them really have any edge or intrigue about them but they they i mean actually to tell you the truth if is garan and mabon have had intrigue unfortunately they killed one but once you've given me the new cast at the launch of secrets of the obscure stick with the fucking cast okay uh these post patches where now we're dealing with Arena, who only appeared for a split second, and we're dealing with Urja, a demon who only appeared for a split second before dying, uh, and Isgaran is now completely off screen, and this waiting, so waiting sorrow, I would call a character for the main expansion, right, in her whole mystery. That sort of bit, you know, you can't just give me ten minutes of Galrath in patch two. Like it's like we've 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 left Dragons Watch for a new cast, and now we've left that new cast again. I think it's really important not to do that. I think, and here's why I'm willing to forgive a lot of the issues with the story here. I think what might, this might not have anything to do with the quality of the writers or the funding for the mini x pack style or the scope of the mini x pack style. It might not have anything to do with any of it. They might have just had an idea. I mean, maybe this comes down to the quality of the writers. They may have just an, an, had an idea, okay, that for these patches they wanted to do like a retread of the Nightfall Realm of Torment style thing. 
and in that case you're supposed to feel isolated so they've isolated us for these patches which is t proven to be a huge misstep and a terrible idea but maybe that's the only reason we've swapped one cast for another there could also be reasons like voice acting issues and you know studio stuff and that's why they've swapped you know, technically Zodja is in these patches, but she's only in the convergences, so who gives a damn, right? Like, like there's maybe there are little things that ended up having huge consequences. I don't know. But I don't know. I, I, it's sort of, if I'm being very, very fair, I think it's, it's, it's sort of ridiculous to do a retread of the Realm of Torment style arc, isolated arc, in your first mini X pack, where you know you're just getting going, where you have limited scope. You need to have one idea and execute it brilliantly. One idea, execute it brilliantly. And what do we get? We get two sort of half-baked casts, a complete U-turn in the middle. You know, they could have just stuck with the, the, the Hogwarts, Wizard's Tower, Fractals stuff. And if you watch my playthrough of Launch Secrets of the Obscure, the Fractal stuff is what I was most excited about. They could have just gone whole on into that. But now we've kind of... So, you know, that's always been the problem with Guild Wars. It's splitting focus. Season 3... Um, is an okay season for gameplay and quality and so on. But in terms of like narrative and story, it's really unfocused. We're going all over the place. We have, you know, the Crichton Civil War. We have Balthazar and Lazarus. We have a little bit with the Tooth of Jormag. We're going all over the place, you know. They really need to just pick a lane. With Icebrood Saga, don't put the Civil War in there as well. Pick a lane, you know. And, and one of the things I was really excited about with mini x packs. If you go back to my announcement of Mini X-Packs, it was recent enough. It was not long ago that they showed all this to us. Uh, my excitement was they can pick an idea and go with it. A Mini X-Pack about the Wizard's Tower. You know? Um, and I'll, maybe I'm being reductive here again, though. Because maybe... All right, fine. Do a thing about the Wizard's Tower. You're going to have to find a conflict. It just so happens they picked a conflict about a demon realm. And in tandem with that, they looked at what was successful and fun before, the Nightfall thing. So they went with an isolated story. I don't know. I don't know. Is this us in the community hindsighting? Or with a bit of foresight, could you have avoided this? Or maybe it is the studio thing. I don't know. Anyway, the main cast... Sorry, I've completely cut the actual comment off here. The main cast was good. And we didn't get enough time with uh, them, especially Isgar. And to be thrown into a different realm with almost an entirely new cast in basically Act 3 of a movie it was jarring and disconnected from what we built up. I think they should have done more with the Wizards for the rest of the Secrets of the Obscure. This saved the whole Nias Rebellion storyline for the next expansion to give it more time. So again, I've seen a lot of people saying that. Split it off. But the thing is, guys... I don't want to see that either. Right, what's the point of mini X-Packs? A new player can prospectively come in without mountains of work to do in terms of like learning the setting, right? So what? So surely it should be the case that many mini X packs are like that, you know? So doing sequential stories in mini X packs, where oh this mini X pack is a sequel to the previous mini X pack, I don't know whether that's a good idea either. Aren't we just essentially doing? the same things that they didn't like doing with the Elder Dragon storyline. Which, by the way, I, I preferred it that way. I liked one long saga. I don't think we should have rushed out of the dragons. I think we could have continued with it. You know, not forever. We kind of get into this whole Sisyphus thing and... Uh, you guys never saw my Pokemon review, but... Uh, my review of Pokemon, the anime, had a lot of very intriguing conversation in it about... Um, you know, that was essentially unending media. It was Ashes on a Quest ostensibly to become the Pokemon master to win a league blah 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 but also the show is really just there to make money so it keeps on going and going and going and it keeps resetting and it was sort of a media analysis it wasn't I mean it was kind of a review of the show but it was more media analysis of okay look at this show that's gone on 20 years how do they end it how could they end it how have they continued to reset and try to dangle the user the the viewers along and uh and then ultimately the Masters 8 stuff happened while I was writing the review and then there was all that stuff. But, you know, Guild Wars would have been kind of the same, you know. Um, we keep pushing that boulder up the hill and hitch a smile on our face, but we will never actually see the final Elder Dragon dead. Well, eventually we're going to want to see the final Elder Dragon dead, right? And was the time right in 2018 with End of Dragons or whatever year it was, 2019? I don't know. Anyway, back to this with the mini X-Packs. I think they should be as isolated as possible. There are more than enough really cool storylines for them to dig in, to pick a lane and play with. Doing your first mini X-Pack, 
only to introduce a bunch of subject material that the mini X-Pack itself cannot deal with, I don't know is a great idea. Maybe later, pair them off, you know? Maybe maybe a mini X-Pack plus a sequel, maybe a trilogy of mini X-Packs if you like. You know, you're not locked in, you can do duologies, you can do trilogies. But when you're starting out, I don't know whether you want to tell half a story. You've already got a problem where it has to have a forced end point immediately halfway anyway because only half of the content's coming out the other half is going to trickle throughout the year that's already difficult enough to deal with i mean maybe that's the same issue actually maybe what happened is arena net was like well fuck we've got to tell a story it's got to feel like a complete story right then and there and then it also needs to have a tale story and a second half which we're going to slowly release how do we do this well let's Let's set one half on Terrier and the other half, the half in the mist. Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Oh, and that worked really well with Nightfall. Oh, it was very isolated. Okay, so look. We're going to introduce this character, Arena. We're going to see her, see her for a second, a bit like Hormir. She's going to disappear. And then she'll come back, and then we'll spend a bunch of time with her. You know, I can, I can imagine that being what happened here with Secrets of the Obscure. And I guess what I'm trying to illustrate working this through in my mind here is, you know, it's, it's a form of copium. It's a way of saying, you know, maybe there were just specific nuances to the way that this story unfolded and they, they they plotted their way through it that's led to these patches feeling really rough and again I'll, I'll recite what i said on the previous part of this stream series which was um you know it's it's very difficult to tell how it's actually going to feel 18 months later with three month gaps between the stuff how tolerant people will be of short patches big patches patches with minimal new story characters and blah 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 so anyway, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, if I'm what, if I sound like I'm waffling a bit, it's because I don't really have a definitive opinion on this just yet. I know that I don't like what I'm experiencing, I'll tell you that. Anyway, uh, the wizard story feels unfinished. At the same time, it feels like we jumped into a different story in the second half without being there for any of the build-up and the setting the stakes for all that stuff gets us invested in the story and the start. I, yeah, like pre-searing, as I was mentioning a second ago, pre-searing is a really great way of setting the stakes for the char conflict and getting you to be really invested in the char conflict. It takes time to do stuff like that. I hope mini x packs can take the time to do that because no matter whether we're dealing with massive wars that the game engine can't really portray or small stories, at the end of the day, people need to be invested in it. And to get invested in it, they need a lot of content, they need a lot of dialogue, they need a lot of talky talk um, and playtime. And is that anathema to mini x packs? ArenaNet already struggled to give you the playtime. The only reason, I'll say this till I'm blue in the face, the only reason Final Fantasy XIV is such a better story and really gets gripping and really gets you into it is because there's so much more content there. Because it's a proper fucking RPG. It's really long. Guild Wars 2 hasn't been a proper fucking RPG since, uh, since Core. They're all too short. Everything's too short. And now we're in mini x back, so Jesus. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, you just need to tell small, smaller stories. I don't know whether that really is the answer. Anyway, uh, I'm hoping we get more of the wizards and demons in the next expansion or in the future so we can get some more time with them. So you say that, but it's like, I, I hear that as just more delaying. You know, it's the same as with the Elder Dragon thing. It's like people, some, not me, certainly not me. No, 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 no. But some people would say, you know, I want the dragon to be done because I want to get to the wizard's tower. I want to get to the pale tree. I, I want to get to this. I want to get to that. The pale tree is a bit of a weird one because at one point it was very integrated into the story. But, um... And now we're doing the same, aren't we? And I kind of feel that here now. It's like, do I really want a mini X back on the Realm of Dreams? Do you guys think that would sell? If they did a mini X back on the Realm of Dreams next? Naos. Uh, I don't think it would. I think a mini X back on some of the other areas of the game that are interesting, like Raisu Palace or like the back half of the Canthan story, all that kind of stuff. I think that would probably sell more. I mean, that's interesting to hear me say that, though. The back half of the Canthan story. I mean, it's not really, is it? It's just geographically close. Anyway, uh, yeah, so there you go. We need more time. Um, so what was I doing here? Here we go. I need a better setup for this. Okay, what was this comment? Oh, this was just a funny one. I just wanted to point this out. I did that rant about 1.25 times speed. This guy says, dude, I always listen to you on 1.25 times speed. Sometimes even 1.5. Don't take it personally. I've listened to almost all my YouTube videos on faster speed. Some people talk way too slowly. Yeah, man. I don't know. I, I, seriously, I don't, I'm not offended by that at all. That's how I watch YouTube. I, I just mentioned how much I don't watch my own content. I know if I watch it, I'm watching it at a sped up rate. <laughs> For sure. I edit it at a sped up rate. It's too slow. Uh, the Mormonator channel 
She said, my issues so far are rooted not in the main story, but side stories. Side stories, achievements, those little hidden lore tidbits take time to write and develop. It's dev time. In the first release, we got news of a coder who created the Heart of the Obscure. It was honestly seeming like she was going to be a huge part of the story. Two patches later, nothing. We also got written confirmation that Mabon had someone he cared about in the realm of dreams. If I remember correctly, did we? Was that Epark though? That was probably just talking about Epark, wasn't it? Anyway, if I remember correctly, there were hints that even the Massar originated from Naos. Yeah, and we have a, a, a reference to Janthir in here. That's probably the most intriguing thing about all this right now. Um, at least the same uh, realm as these new demons. Uh, two patches later, nothing. In the last patch, we got a huge chunk of discourse about how the spirits of the wild might be bad with a decently gruesome story written by Frode. If that story also turns out to mean nothing for the next expansion, my complaints remain. I'd rather the dev time have gone to adding context and background to the main story so it feels like less of a copy-pasted narrative. Don't give me random tidbits of lore that just turn out to be a relevant fan fiction. So I don't really agree with this comment here. Um, I don't think you're being fair with this at all. And the reason for that is this. Look. Guild Wars 1 set out to do its own stories. It told them very poorly. It's, you know... It, it's a very primitive game in terms of its storytelling. It only really got good at Nightfall, but at the end of the day, it wasn't really that good. But then Guild Wars 2 shifted to this dragon story, right, with Eye of the North. Set up about the dragons. Guild Wars 2 has almost entirely been in service about the dragon stuff. Now, they have dropped some breadcrumbs and some things you can latch onto and say, oh, this is something interesting to go to. <gasps> oh, the Infinity Ball. Oh, this, or this. Some of them have already come back in the form of minor Easter eggs and quirky little things as the dragon storyline was going along. But now that we're done with the dragon storyline, after all these years, Terry is kind of empty. You know, that's one of the reasons why I'm falling out of love with the story and lore discussion. It's because it feels very thin. Like, there's not much really... Like, they set almost nothing. One of the reasons the Realm of Dreams seems to have come out of nowhere is because they, were not, they weren't setting stuff up. And like I said in the previous stream, you know, I think some of this could have been happening even as far back as the Icebreed Saga. So, Terry feels empty. It is the absolute duty of these mini X packs to start dropping new breadcrumbs. I think they did it perfectly here. I think when they t hint about the spirits of the wild, yeah, do that. Do that shit. And do it again maybe in the next mini X pack. Just a tiny little comment. Do it again in the mini X pack after that. Drop little hints so that four or five down the line, you have a story you can do. Law nerds have been thinking and talking about it long enough. Casuals have seen references for long enough that now it's like, oh fuck, that's a thing. Yeah, I'm really excited to see that story. They have to begin this. Your comment is kind of like saying, if things don't get instant resolutions, it's therefore irrelevant fanfic. Like, that's bullshit, man. They're setting up a universe and a product to be sustained for years and years and years. They have to drop these things in there. So I think that's the right thing to do. And you can't expect every little hint to instantly expand off into a massive storyline. I mean, Christ, live in the real world for a second here. They're not even doing the main storyline that satisfactorily. So, you know. But I, I do defend the devs with stuff like that Norn thing, uh, and I say more. You know, this hint, this hint about Janthir. Keep trickling them in. It. Keep trickling them in as it goes along, and they don't need to pay it off straight away. But they do need them to be visible. One of the reasons the Wizard's Tower here worked very well was because it was very evident. It was very, very visible. Uh, you know, it was a physical thing in the world, and I think a lot of those little hints actually aren't good enough just yet. Um, the claw of jaw, the tooth of jaw mag, also was a uh, another really good uh, example, of something big and evident, and could have been. Yeah, and as we saw, guys, the tooth it was hiding there in Holbrack. Nobody chipped it for years and years and years and years, and then one day a CGI trailer came out on YouTube of a mysterious stranger who destroyed the tooth, and we were like, what the hell? And then it said. Guild Wars 2, Icebrood Saga, expansion coming this fall. And then there was that amazing expansion dedicated to Jormag. Oh my god, with all that cool stuff about the Whispers. It set up the Char Civil War a little bit. What an exciting time to play the game that was, right? Remember? And then we had the Char Civil War expansion and Primordis was lurking. And then we had the, the Primordis expansion. Oh, remember when we saw all of Primordis? You know, that giant head we saw at the bottom of Draconis Mons, and his whole body was there in the fi finale of that expansion. Like, after 60 hours of gameplay, there he was. That was my favorite moment. And the Primordus was the first to rise, the last to fall. And then the, then, and then the hint, the tease. Finally, we were going to Canther. They'd been asking for years, and we were finally going to Canther and learning about the mysterious Deep Sea Dragon, and they ended the arc. And we were all sitting here, fat and happy, in 2028. And, uh, and now Secrets of the Obscure has been a bit of a disappointment. But hey, don't worry. They did the Dragon Saga super well. 
So, I have faith. Alright, the last comment here. Uh, from Paradaxand. I do love me a wall of text. And probably the main reason I'm putting this here is because they opened by saying, I probably missed the cutoff for the next Q&A. <laughs> and no, you didn't miss the cutoff. Look, I will look at the comments right before I go live. Uh, but I definitely got a wall of text for you. The TLDR of most of my gripes can be summed up with the... The, the usual issue the story faces is trying to do far too much in too little time. I mean, we probably talked enough about this, but let, let's, let's go through it. This is such an old problem at this point, and it makes me sad that they continue to make the same mistake over and over. Mistake is a strong word, but I would love to see them tell stories that are a scope that allows for breathing room and actual character development instead of these massive scale thrill rides where characters are introduced in one instance only to die in the next over and over again. That thing with Urger... I mean, that is, that is so bad. Really? I didn't even talk- what did I talk about on my previous Sutu stream? I mean, it's... You know, they learned that lesson with Belinda. They really did, okay? You can't introduce a character that people barely seen and then ask for an emotional response when they die. You can't do that. If- and- and- But the thing is, the Urger scene isn't quite as bad as the Belinda stuff. Belinda, they funded like this whole cutscene with mocap and Marjorie weeping and crying. And remember, there was like a data mine, different edition of it, and they've been really careful. Blah 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 blah. And it was just a complete waste of time. Urger, at least, is just a few lines of dialogue and kind of a hand wavy little moment. So, Urger's not as bad. I mean, what are we saying here? That they can never kill a character off anymore because none of them are going to get the screen time. <laughs> so. So maybe, maybe just do it anyway. Uh, maybe <laughs> we got the urge uh, story. Um, I want to start this by saying that I really enjoyed the launch story from the x pack I was coming in without a lot of expectations. That sort of sums me up as well. I, I reasonably enjoyed it. And I loved all the background and setting up that they did. I thought that that stuff was really good. Like, really, The other problem with going to the Realm of Dreams, guys, is what I liked most about Secrets of the Obscure was all the, like, the hardcore proper world building and timeline establishment that they did in those lore side books. They were really fucking cool about that. Like giving an actual name to the Staff of the Mist, referring to all this geeky, awesome stuff, proving that there are real nerds who truly deeply love and understand Tyria out there still. Like there was a lot of really good good stuff in the wizard's tower and around the launch of secret of the obscure and it was all because it was like hands-on understanding of tyria and then we've just ended up here and you know what did the secret of the obscure maps do better than anything else probably the side pickups and stuff i think you know there were a lot of interactables there was a lot of cool shit there that's what it did better than anything else and what does the realm of dreams have you know we, we there's really not much here now and even if there was a lot here, it would be mostly irrelevant stuff about, Oh, I'm going to be eaten. Uh. You know what? Oh, by the way, this is not in any of the comments, but somebody pointed out as well. They do, they do t far too much telling, not showing here. You know, don't tell me that the demons are eating and consuming each other. Give me a moment where I watch a demon feast on another demon. I want to see a demon bite into someone's head. I want to see his skull crunch. And I want to see him suck up his eye like a bit of spaghetti. <laughs> No, all right, not that crazy, but, you know, we we got to see some of this stuff. You can't just tell me, oh, it's so bad, but spend most of our time just dealing with these guys that are wandering around scared, you know. Also, I'll note as well, one big disappointment for me for Secrets of the Obscure in general is mini X-Packs. I liked the idea of exploring more of Tyria. <gasps> guys, we can go to the Earth Legions. Oh, my God, Blaze Ridge Mountains. Could do a little bit more. We can go to the Inland Sea and the Far Shiver Peak, see what the Coden are up to. Oh my god, the Battle Isles. Oh my god, look at this place over here. It looks totally weird and new. You know, I liked that idea. And then what did they do for the first mini X pack? The Horn of Maguma, apparently. Except, let's be real, none of the coast is really there. This suggests it's on the coast, but it's not. It's a floating island. It's just, it's all completely disconnected from Tyria. Okay, so don't worry, we're going to add a new map. Oh, well, this one's even more disconnected from Tyria. So, I did, they, you know, I like to play RPGs to go on adventures and explore. And I feel like I didn't really get that from this expansion. And that's what I was sort of looking forward to. You know, if you weren't keen on the Elder Dragon stuff, if you weren't... By the way, there's two problems that happened with the previous story with Guild Wars 2. To be... There's two tangled issues that players had. And I want to be very clear about it because most people do not separate the two. But they are very important. One, the story was about the Elder Dragons, and maybe you were wrong to feel this way, 
but maybe you felt that the Elder Dragons were irredeemably bad and you could never get a good story out of them. Okay, fine. May, in my opinion, you were wrong to feel that way. So that's one issue. We had to get away from the Elder Dragons. The other issue is Guild Wars 1. And people often conflate the two because Guild Wars 1 started setting up the Elder Dragon stuff because of Eye of the North, and people don't really get that Eye of the North itself was only in service of Guild Wars 2 in the first place or whatever. But the point is Guild Wars 1. People were sick of everything being dictated. Okay, the problem that it might seem with the Elder Dragon story is that it's all a foregone, foregone, foregone conclusion. So why should I care about this story when I know we're going to be having a dragon that dies at the end? Now that's such a surface level take that it's like, it's not worth anything because no matter what story you tell with a hero, it's us versus evil. We're going to be triumphant. Pick the face of the evil. That, that's like a, that's a non-start. That's not a real analysis of how the media works at all, but whatever. Okay. The point is apparently the Elder Dragon story is bad because it's a foregone conclusion. We already know where we're going. Separate to that, but is the exact same thing as Guild Wars 1. Oh, we're going back to Alona? Of course, because we went there in Guild Wars 1. Oh, we're going back to Kantha? Of course, because we, we went there in Guild Wars 1. Oh, we went to the Maguma jungle? Of course, because it was there in Guild Wars 1. So th it's the same thing. I don't care about Guild Wars 1. I want something new. There are a lot of people who feel that way. As a Guild Wars 1 fanboy, I wasn't quite in that camp, but I think there's a lot of logic to what they were saying. So we get rid of the Elder Dragons, and at the same time, we do the last Guild Wars 1 location, Kantha. We have cleared the deck. No obligation to Guild Wars 1. Or retreading that lore or learning that lore or anything. No obligation to the Elder Dragons and learning all that lore and the long timeline of that. We are free. We have cleared the deck. But it is two separate situations that are going on there. Um, so then when it comes to the mini X packs, well, we can explore somewhere new, right? We can go somewhere that Guild Wars 1 didn't dictate. We can take advantage of it. And then it wasn't taken advantage of at all. And in fact, a lot of this stuff was kind of, you know, just... Hardcore nods and, and and fan service for us Guild Wars 1 players. Which I appreciate as a Guild Wars 1 player, but I also think might have been a bit of a misstep, actually. For the first mini X pack, maybe fuck the Guild Wars 1. If the whole point was to get away from those people and the baggage of the past, fuck the Guild Wars 1 players. Just tell something really awesome that everyone can understand at the start. Give them a sky scale at the start so they have gameplay parity with the veterans. Refresh the, the audience, you know. It's kind of that business versus art discussion, I suppose, a little bit that's going on here. Anyway, I, I think there's also another argument, which is that, okay, look, we're, at the same time as all of this, we're trying to establish Tyria as a long-term thing, so we have to write some real lore about the past. We have to have real ideas about where we're going in the future, and doing that by necessity, if we're going to do it sincerely, means you have to honor Guild Wars 1, so it, no matter what you do, Secrets of the Obscure has to be full of Guild Wars 1 stuff, if you're really paving a trail, trail for the future, which is what I view all these pickups and so on as being. Um, so, you know, I think that's forgivable as well on that side. Anyway, uh, this is all a bit of a tangent. I can't what originally prompted me to talk about that stuff. Uh, let's go back to this screen here. Finish this up here. Um, <clears throat> where were we? There were more interesting characters of actual Edge, which the franchise doesn't always do a good... Wait, in Secrets of the Obscure? Who was Edgy in Secrets of the Obscure? Is Garen? I think there was some interesting ethics and morality conversation about Is Garen, but the rest. There's also some interesting side lore and insights into deep lore. Is Garen was a really cool seeing, seeming character, and I loved all the weird ethical stuff with the Wizards Court that they were teasing. Since the first Nyes release, I can't help but feel the story quality's fallen off a cliff. Actually, in that Reddit thread I mentioned, people were suggesting that there's like a new team that did this story. I don't know if that's true, guys. Look, I think they have an expect team. I don't know how they're structured. They won't say it, will they? But um, my assumption is that they're all like one big block, all working together. You know, it's all made from the consumer end, right? Remember, never forget this, guys. The point is, we paid for all this already. It's just coming out slowly. So you would think that the whole thing is made together to complement itself, you know? It's one package from the same set of minds at the same point in time largely you know obviously some of it gets developed a bit later uh but yeah uh so i don't know whether i really believe that there's a whole new team that explains why as this guy here says it's fallen off a cliff but hey i really like what you said about the demon aspect of the cryptus almost being set dressing 
the part where you mentioned that sad butterfly people could, uh, they could be sad butterfly people and nothing would have really changed. Yeah, I liked that comment of mine as well. Thank you. I did like what I said. Hmm, the smell of my own farts. Uh, because I've also been feeling that way, but I hadn't quite put my finger on it so eloquently. Oh, I am eloquent, aren't I, guys? <laughs> uh, I don't have any problem with some of the demons being allies or likable in some way, but they, uh, feel like they have almost no demonic qualities at all. They exist in this horror realm, and they've been invading other realms and brutalizing each other for thousands of years, supposedly. Somehow that hasn't affected their culture at all, I guess. They act remarkably like average humans. The hungry quagon demons are probably the most demonic, are probably the most demonic, assuming... S seeming of everything here and I did like them a lot. Are they really? I haven't seen that event yet Or where you're getting that from. I wish there was more of that even for the good demons This latest story also has me feeling a bit more disconnected from my player character than ever before uh, This is interesting as well. There's a lot of discussion about the Wayfarer or the, the Wayfinder Which one is it? Or the and the Commander um, I'm not really so interested in that. You know, I, I don't care if my character doesn't even speak frankly but I know that a lot of people really connect to the, the commander. I really don't like how the commander is just 100% on board with Pather and Demons. Oh, I mean, yeah, there's that. That's always been a problem with Guild Wars. Because it's not really a true RPG, is it? In the sense that we can't really affect the outcome of the things we're doing. That's one of the reasons I like the, person, the personality system so much. You know, let me be ferocious about helping P Pather. I don't like you. I don't trust you. I think you're a prick. But I will... See where this goes. Versus, oh, look at the oppressed demon people. The personality system allowed us to be either of those characters, whichever one we wanted. At, and at what cost? Just a little bit of text? It doesn't have to be voice acted. I really think the personality system is great. It, it helps them avoid pit holes like this. But anyway, yeah, the commander is just a hunt. I wouldn't say the commander is 100% on board, by the way. I get the vibe that, that she or he is more like 90, 80. But yeah, they, we're largely on board. And I, as a... I personally don't like pay uh, Okay, if I was the commander, I wouldn't be trusting her at all. I wouldn't even be in this realm, frankly. I, I'm 100% with this Garen, to be honest. But the game kind of forces us to have this other view, the naive view. And whether ArenaNet believes it's naive or not, I guess, comes down to how this story ends. Uh, and yeah, that sucks. But I don't know whether that's the secret of the obscure criticism. That's just kind of a Guild Wars thing, isn't it, really? That's the format that this RPG has taken. It feels ham-fisted sometimes, how pro pather they are. Yeah, it does. In this latest patch, Gareth was the character I agreed with the most, and it felt like the writers won't let me play the commander that way. Yep. Uh, I have to love pather I have to love pather whether I want to or not. I'm hoping there's a betrayal coming, but to be honest, I would be surprised. Yeah, I... I mean, let me ask you guys in the live chat right now. I mean, I really don't know. Is, there gonna, is she going to betray us or not? It's... I really think the only good story is that she does. I really think it's a bad story if she doesn't. Like, and you might say, well, so now it's so predictable, they have to subvert our expectations, and she actually has to be... No, 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 no. Look, it, this is too heady and cerebral. It's too much out-of-media conversation. It's not actually in the story itself that it's overly telegraphed because we looked behind the scenes. And fuck pulling the rug out from beneath people. Just tell a good story, okay? The only story is that she betrays us. The extent to the damage that this betrayal does, I don't know. And we'll think about that as we play through in a second. My expectation is that Pather will be as good a commander as she thinks she is. And the demons will be liberated and become our new friends. Uh, that feels like the type of story the writers of this age of the franchise are interested in telling. Personally, other stories with more nuance and depth. Hopefully they prove me wrong. Yeah, it's that thing. It's like, who's writing it? Is it... Is it old-timers who are kind of bored of the standard fare that would tell something a little bit more interesting? Or is it people who are kind of newly about Guild Wars and would really rather they're on the Unreal Engine project and, you know, this is the kind of thing we've seen a comic book write, so here, let's, 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 let's have a demon war. That's what they wrote, guys. They wrote a demon war. And we're going to save the, the, the good demons versus the bad demons because, of course, we're the good guy. And that's it. That's as far as it goes, you know. It sort of depends on the mind of the right. I think that's the big problem I have with all these massive, like... These games with so many chefs in the kitchen. So many people. You don't really get a sense of who you're talking to anymore. You know, with a lot of games and a lot of story, tightly focused things, well-created things from a couple of people at a specific point in time, you have a very clear idea of, like, what they think about storytelling, the kind of roads you'll go down. And that's not to say that you, you can't be surprised by them. 
but you sort of have a certain baseline of expectation of what's happening. With Guild Wars, I really have no expectation anymore, and not in like a fun, oh, is the Hound going to beat Brienne of Tarth, or is Brienne of Tarth going to beat the Hound, and you really have no fucking idea as you're watching it. I mean, I shouldn't use that example, because book readers are going to come at me. But, um, you know, in just kind of a weird way of like, oh, I don't know what they think is a good story. <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird. On the same line, I find it really hard to believe how many of the Astral Ward are really are ready to side with the Cryptus. Well, no, to be fair to this patch, they did say they're following the Commander. They're not really... Well, I don't, yeah, and the Commander's following Paether. Yeah, I don't know. If it, the problem is, well, guys, right? If Paether does betray us, it is to make the Commander look like an idiot. And I promise, if they write what is fundamentally, in my opinion, the better story, i.e. she betrays us, if they do that people will there will be another subsection of the community who's furious that they made the commander a bumbling asshole that just walked into this trap so their backs kind of against the wall here now you know um and you know a beat like that can work in the middle of a longer story that released all at once but when it's getting dangled out over a whole year it's now going to feel like the co even though there was very limited playtime going on it's going to feel like the commander was being duped for an entire year you know and it's going to be it's going to create a more negative reaction so they might do the more banal um like anodyne story simply on the basis that they don't want to tick people off about the commander because, you know, we're, we're, we're pricks in the community. We get so mad about every little thing, you know. In a lot of ways, I look at them as just, like, flinching, you know. The, com the community is like one of those bullies, you know. They raise their fists and they, they, they go to punch and they go, <laughs> made you flinch, <laughs> made you flinch. And in the end, you just got this wreck of a person shivering and crying in the corner, like, just scared of every little thing they do, every little move they make because some fucking teeth-gnashing nerd is going to come at them anyway. And all they wanted to do was make video games and make people happy and, to, you know, do entertainment. And and they're trying really hard to listen to all of the criticism, but it's the internet and it's this monster and it fucking just beats them into the corner. So now the kind of stories they tell is, look, 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 pa we've met Pather and she's cool and look, we saved the demons. Please, it's okay, right? You know, I, would, that, I wouldn't be surprised if that is a motivation for... <laughs> that was a bit of a limp story. On the same l line, I find it really hard to believe how many of the Astral Ward are ready to side with the Cryptus. It feels like they tried to make it about 50-50 Ward members trusting and not trusting the demons. Really? I didn't get that vibe. I might be wrong though, I might have just not seen the material yet. This is an organisation that's been fighting these things for thousands of years, supposedly. I'd imagine the number of them who'd be willing to give the Cryptus the benefit of the doubt would be quite small, honestly. I do think some would, but the ratio feels off. I mean, how are you getting a sense of the ratio? I also can't help but feel that every one of these 50-50 conversations... Oh, you mean like when we're standing around at camp, idle dialogue is like one guy's pro and one guy's con? Is that what you're saying? They're written in a way that... Well, I, you know, there would be a sitting bias for the people who are in the realm to be pro, right? Doesn't mean the entire organization, Tyrion's side included, is 50-50. It's written in a way that implies the cryptist trusting members of the ward is right. Usually they get the last word. Or they sort of convince the other one. Yeah, ArenaNet, when you talk about ham-fisted, ArenaNet is very ham-fisted with stuff like this. There's a lot of moments where it's like, oh, do they think they're being so? <laughs> you know, and it's not so. Um, but again, like, it's like, who's their audience as well? I just talked about you don't know who the, the creator is. Who the fuck is the audience as well? In a lot of ways, I feel like they are writing stories for 14-year-olds. Um, because ostensibly, that's where the money is, you know, those are people with a lot of time on their hands who can hyperfixate, who will soon be productive members of society, who will spend a lot on microtransactions and stuff. You can't just have a game that caters to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old people who end up just, you know. I mean, maybe you can. Who knows what this industry is, to be honest. Maybe in 40 years, guys, there will be video game genres specifically there to appeal to retirement homes. Who the fuck knows, right? Maybe you can do that. But my the impression I get is that they're trying to write... Look, they have an age rating for the game as well, frankly. My impression is an MMO needs a lot of people, so you've got to aim at that lower band. So if your demographic is that lower... You know, people who basically don't know what they're talking about with 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 media, you know. Kids that just watch a few anime shows and that's 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 it. That's, that's what they got. Um, maybe this is a really cool story to them, you know. And so maybe they're doing the right thing by... You know, it's boring to us now that we're getting a bit older and we've watched masterpieces like The Wire and The Sopranos and whatever, you know, whatever buzzwordy thing I can think of here. 
Though I do genuinely think that the wire deserves it. Uh, you know, they're not writing for you. They're not writing for fans of True Detective Season 1. They're writing for 14-year-olds. So yeah, of course Paper's going to be a good guy. Get over it. You're playing an MMO. Right? And if you want an adult MMO with, with stronger themes and questioning ethics and all that kind of stuff, I don't know, go play Star Trek Online? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the last tangent I'll go on here is this. I thought the writing room was excited to move away from the main cast because it felt like they'd gotten too big with too many characters. Oh, do you think that that's what it was, that it had gotten too big? I never got that impression. That made it hard to tell good stories. We've gained a whole new cast, but they seem to be adding more and more characters right now at breakneck pace. They are... How many characters in the expansion that we've met and since have died? I think it's four or five or something. Sometimes it literally has them in be introduced in one instance and die in the next. There's a pr prominent villain in this story arc that this is true for. I won't say since we haven't seen it on air yet. I just don't care about any of them anymore because none of them have any character development. I was starting to like some of the wizards by the end of the end of launch content, but as you mentioned, they disappeared for the most part. Uh, I can't say a single demon character has made any impression on me at all. They seem to just exist and be killed off as fast as possible. To be honest, it's hard to feel like Isgaran is that cool anymore because the Cryptus leadership are dropping like flies as soon as we arrive. It seems like they aren't so tough after all and maybe the wizards court just kind of sucks at their jobs. That's really good. I like that bit at the end there. I've ranted enough. Thanks for the stream. Yeah, um... All of this is a huge amount of hot... Everything I've just said here, all these comments, the Reddit thread I was talking about, possibly a bit of the live chat, which I'm uh, uh, afraid to say I've not looked at enough here, guys. Oh, I know. Thank you very much, man. Hip Hop Hurrah. 23 months you've been a member, and what content have I given you for membership? That's unreal, man. Thank you. Um... It's weird. I was looking at my YouTube comments the other day, and I had a gold comment. Like, the entire comment was backed in gold, and it had it with some weird numbers and letters there, and I think it was someone donated in a regular YouTube comment. Is that a thing? It blew my mind. I have no idea what that was. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, the character's been killed. Look, all of this is a lot of hot air from all sides, from myself as well. Okay. Um, and I think it all gets resolved with the exact same thing. It's the same criticism I had since Heart of Thorns came out. It's the same criticism many had in the bite-sized Living World Season 1 episodes. It's the same criticism that applied to Season 2, 3, POF, just about. POF was actually getting near the edge. POF was very close. And and, and so on. And it's there's not enough screen time. That's all it is. All this shit gets resolved with more screen time. More time to interact with these people. To care about them, to care about the stakes, to care about the setting, to care about the characters. You just can't do it if we're if we're rushing through. At least not in any really fun way, I think. Um, so how does that track with Mini X Max? Who are the crap knows? There you go. Okay, so. Uh, speaking of which, let's. <laughs> oh my god, I gotta actually do a stream now. How has that been over an hour? Hmm. Okay, well, we want to we wanna do the story here, so let's move on through. And for what it's worth, if anybody wants to join my party and do these instances with me, that's totally fine. What I'm going to do now is shift gears to the live chat and just interact with you guys a bunch here now. I'm going to have the dialogue muted since we already saw this story. And I'm just going to do this. Cause as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware, I need to... Well, I don't actually know. Can I equip the staff already? Is it account bound? I think it's character bound, isn't it? And uh, we'll get we'll rock it back through the story because we already. <laughs> I mean, what did we see on the previous stream? Is it possible we make zero progress on this stream? I mean, I'm literally fine with that, by the way, because I would rather have meaningful reasons to produce Guild Wars 2 content over the next. How long are we looking at here? 61 days. So if we do some, you know, Q and A kind of live streamy things where we make very little progress on the story, I really don't mind. You know, it's this or nothing, guys. So. Well, they'll probably, you know, there'll be patch note videos and stuff. We've got the cool, exciting patch coming up on the 17th. And when I beat Ceres, I'll do a thing. Oh, yeah, there was something else to talk about with Ceres CM. And that was, uh, so yeah, they've confirmed it's getting nerfed because it's too hard. But they are keeping the opportunity to play the current tuning forevermore. And there's a special title for it. So all of the, ne this, this content needs to be codified it needs names it needs clear ideas it needs structures and ideas of when we can expect it but basically there's a cmcm -CM now you've got the normal mode 
then you've got the CM, then you've got the CM achievement, then you have the CM CM, uh, which is, you know, which is what we'll be going for, um, which is cool. But, I mean, let's have actual names for all this stuff. And it's nice. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the, the big discussion in the past was, what do they do? Do they put out entirely new wings? Or do they... Or do they they halt all of it? I, I don't know. It, it was such a different time, I guess, uh, that, um, back during uh, HOT and POF. Or do they find a way to, like, bumble through having difficulties? And they've kind of bumbled through having difficulties here, which is nice. Okay, uh, what's this? Uh... Why do you think their target? Why do you think that is their target demographic? I mean, Guild Wars 2 is marketed as a casual MMO. Aren't casual MMOs for people with less times on their hands? No, casual MMO. First of all, I don't think it is marketed as a casual MMO. Let's actually get in the fucking mission here. I don't think it is. Thank you for the donation, by the way. I don't think it is marketed as a casual MMO. The community talks about it as a casual MMO. It was all. It, what it was marketed at was an MMO that respects your time. Okay. And yeah, that basically aligns parallel with the idea that you can play it casually. But the fact is, you can play WoW casually. You can play F14 casually. I assume you can play ESO casually. You can play any MMO casually. That doesn't really even have any meaning. The fact it's a casual MMO, really, that's just a tag that's come from the community because the game has failed to cultivate a hardcore user base for PvE, PvP, or World vs. World. That's all it is, is an excuse for a failing to offer something to another contingent of the community. I, in my opinion, it's an MMO's duty to fulfill all of them. First and foremost, yes, it has to be playable casually, otherwise you have literally no community. It has to be playable casually. That's just an MMO. It, so it's kind of bullshit. Like, the idea that then we can hide behind this, this, this phrase, oh, Guild Wars 2 is a casual MMO, so that's why it doesn't have... That's why it's it's been unsatisfying for all these. Like, there's bullshit. It's just failed, guys. You can't just hide behind that term. So I don't really like that. And yeah, I'd say all MMOs they aim. I mean, do they? I was gonna say all MMOs aim for a, a lower age range. Look, the games industry is very young. All right. And when you play a lot of old games, like I've been looking so much at the old Tomb Raiders and stuff, and when you look at old games in the 90s and stuff, you've got to remember, guys, like Mike, Mike was in chat a second ago. Um, I was talking to him the other day about, like, our parents and, um, and, like, what adults we knew growing up that played games, and there weren't many. Like, did your dad play games? Did your mum play games? It's, it's really weird for me, almost, still to think of adults playing games because you've got to remember the games industry is very young and it was the it was a thing for children and adolescents for you that was the primary demo that was who was playing these things those are the people with times on hand the mums and dads bought it for the kids that was the, the the predominant view for a very long time and that's that's definitely shifted don't get me wrong that's really shifted and a lot of full-blown adults is a very normal thing to play games now but i think that like when it comes to like marketing and the industry's idea of who their consumers are and where the fat end of the wedge is it's a bit slower to catch up so when you're making an mmo that has to appeal to the lowest common denominator as many people as possible you're gonna skew it younger you're gonna skew it younger based on where this industry was for the first 40 years of its existence you know if we really want to go back but let's be real throughout the late 80s 90s early 2000s you know that 20 year period and yeah, we're another two decades on from that now. And I think that, yeah, this should be... That's why I mentioned that retirement thing. Because is it wrong to make an MMO that caters... But I don't know, guys, as well. Look, we're talking about products that have to cater to the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator isn't really interested in... I mean... I don't know. I can't... Watch my Shadow of the Tomb... Watch the next few Shadow of the Tomb Raider episodes that are going up soon. I'm Like, I'm putting up the next one... Um, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow or the day after, but I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow. Uh, that's like the end of the game in that. Listen to, uh, look at that game. Listen to the things that I have to say about like how boring and just dull and muted every interesting facet of that story could have been because they can't really do anything controversial or pointed or artistic. They can't do it. Too much money is riding on it. You cannot invite risk. You know, so any of these massively funded projects, they cannot be risky with the storytelling that they tell. Therefore, they cannot be provocative. 
they cannot stick in your mind. You're going to get generic boilerplate cu cookie, cutty, cu cookie cutter stories. You're going to get inoffensive stories. You're going to get stories that toe the line as much as possible. Because the lowest common denominator isn't really interested in being made to think. Or being tackled. They just want to be a hero that goes through, presses buttons and kills a boss. You know. By and large. That's, that's one way of looking at it. On the other way, I look at, uh, on the other hand, I look at certain elements of, you know, what 14's done with its story, where it did actually get really interesting and really ethical, and, you know, you look, like, the story of Emmett Selk is a very nuanced and fun thing to think about in terms of whether he's a real villain or not. And it, as far as I can see, FF14 has the, uh, aims for the same sort of age range as Guild Wars could be. But Guild Wars has no characters like that. No characters. You know, there's a reason I like the frenemies and those sort of... I, well, maybe we're in the middle of one. Maybe Isgaran is a little bit like that. It all depends how they write this at the end. Will Pather betray us? Is Isgaran right or is the commander right? By the way, I changed my warrior's hair. I, I Basically, this warrior, the whole idea was to be as tall as possible. So, I was using... this hair because it comes up quite high but now i'm thinking just volume you know is the better way to go and i'm not going ridiculous you know we're, we're wearing legendary armor we're, we're still somewhat elegant but i love how huge the orine hammer is you know look look at this this hammer is bigger than garrett just the head of the hammer is about the same size as garrett himself okay so let's go to arena Jaw Mag was kind of like that for a bit. Yeah, until the end. I mean, oh, God, Dragonstorm. You know, as much as Primordus got fucked in that story, Jaw Mag got fucked so much harder. I'm a Primordus fanboy, so fine, I'll talk about Primordus a lot. But Jesus Christ. Jaw Mag is the same thing. Really cunning. Could she be setting us up for a trap? Is she evil? Is she not? Ooh. Oh, yeah, she's evil. And she's just going to walk in and die in the in the dragon storm encounter at the end. There you go. All done. It's like, oh, God, is Paytha going to be Jormag 2.0? <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. You're watching the dragon storm cutscene as you say this. By the way, I will defend dragon storm. I will defend. And I've done it many times before. And I want to just reiterate as well. Um, I want to... Dragonstorm is really, really good content as far as, like, convergence content is concerned. You know, End of Dragons had the Dragon's End meta. This expansion has convergences. The Icefruit Saga has Dragonstorm. You know, it's a big spectacle fight with a ton of people. You get a two gold, gold pop plus some expansion-specific rewards at the end. That's like a format, guys, now. All right, that's a thing now. Convergence is the current version. Dragonstorm and that, that cinematic and stuff, it is a abysmal end to the dragon saga well it's not really the end of the dragon saga is it? But, you know, it's an abysmal end to a huge section of the dragon saga it's a terrible end for those two dragons but as far as like farmable content that's pretty and has a little bit of interest it's good i'll defend dragon storm on those grounds i think they did very well with dragon storm on those grounds it's uh it's the other ones that i'm you know, so if I see someone go online and say, oh, Dragonstorm's the best, I don't immediately get all angry and bristle or anything. I really don't. I think, well, they're probably looking at it from the perspective of, you know, it is good farm content. Guild Wars 3, Char in space. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've gone through periods where I'm really on and all about the Guild Wars 3 thing, but I'm, I'm just not anymore, I'm afraid. Um... I think, I think whatever new thing they do surely should be another IP. All right, complete events. Christ, are we going to get this? Let me actually check. Okay, what I'll do is I'll just keep my build exactly as is. We'll just see if I can equip a staff. I can already equip a staff. Holy fuck. Okay, that's really good. So let's do berserkers. I mean, what would be fun on staff? Let's just put force and impact. Two power infusions. Alright, and what's a cool staff to pick? Sadly, they didn't release, like, skins for these, you know, like the actual elite spec system would have had. I haven't touched this since the beta, guys. Harvest Grin. 
I don't know. Anyone got a recommendation for a good staff for warrior? I've always liked the Hydra staff, personally. Something that hits people would be kind of cool. The Spire of Samarog. But maybe we could go fancier. Oh, there are there are weapons for them. Really? Are they good? You just want to point out, look how long this instance is where there's zero gameplay. Yeah, and I skipped a bunch of dialogue. But to be fair, I was standing there idling for quite a long time. Yeah, that's another problem that Guild Wars has got. Um, the whole standing there doing nothing. And then just... I mean, there's, there's basically no gameplay left in this game. If all you do is the main story. I, look, that sounds horrendous to say, but there's basically not. The whole game is just sit there while your eyes gloss over. You're sitting there just listening to people ramble away, not doing anything. And I hope to God you're invested in the story. Because otherwise you, you're going to be on your phone or you're going to be all tabbed, right? In an instance like we just played. And then what's the rest? Doing like events and stuff out here in the open world where you know it's going to finish anyway. I'm not advocating people leech, right? But there's absolute... Once, you're, once you've played enough of this game, there's absolutely no reason to actually focus on anything. There's not moments where it's like, oh, I'm going to go res this guy and this is really exciting. Whoa, what a big swing. There's not, oh, I healed this guy and I created a, a cool success here. We got gold because of me instead of bronze. Oh. You know, there's not, oh, we broke this break bar, this break bar, so now the whole thing's a lot easier. I mean, there is that a little bit sometimes, I'll give you that. There's not even, oh, I need to DPS hard. There, it's literally just stand there just, I'm not advocating people leech, but the whole game conditions you to just walk around, like, glossing over, like, you know, listening to fucking wooden potatoes while you do this, you know? <laughs> and fail, because you don't actually know how it works. Uh, you know, when you're in an event, because it's just blobs of people wandering around. And um, it's just like this, it's this weird thing with all of Guild Wars 2 now. I just feel like if you're doing the main story stuff, there's so little to latch on to. I think that's why I found Sarah's so CM so invigorating. Because it's like a, a shining light, you know. It's like, holy fuck, look. I'm playing the game. I'm really playing the game, you know. Uh, which is not an experience I get from the main story. I always have a problem, and I will I will openly acknowledge a bit of a bias in me. I'll, I always have a problem with the game in that I do these story patches in a group. So I played it with four other people this time. And, <laughs> you know, there's an achievement in this patch uh, to, like, clear one of the story beats in less than 60 seconds. And I swear to God, I swear to God, I was in a party, right? And they're all fucking meta monkey nutters that have to have like, oh, we need we need quickness and alacrity, and we all need to be in Zerka, yeah, for fucking story missions. Like, what's the matter with you? Anyway, that's how they play, right? So <laughs> we're in this story mission. It's like beat this instance in less than sixty seconds. I swear to God, we did it in like three seconds. It was like auto a couple of guys, and it was done. Serious. I swear to God. So I have this problem as well with the main story where even the bits that might give a bit and might have a little bit of grit just absolutely get annihilated. Um, does the achievement is still super easy solo, says Tulip. Well, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> it wasn't just because we had a ridiculous comp. I think at the first Sutu patch I played here, I did a build on a Herald where I pressed no buttons. In the story instances with friends, I just put facets up to give them 25 might fury quickness. <laughs> But that was it. That was all I did. I didn't press any other buttons. I just walked around spamming insane boons and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm by AFK holding a few facets. I think I ran it with Malix as well, so I got one extra pip, so I literally could pure AFK it as long as my healer healed me a little bit. It was quite funny. Uh, we're going to do events. I don't know. There's a couple of mentor tags. Also, I've got to keep my eye out for more pickups and things to learn. What don't I know? What I need is a Cossage lore dump, really. <laughs> a Cossage was typing in the uh, the Spud Discord. Uh, I cleaned the channel names and stuff up a little bit in there as well. If you guys have any opinions on that, you can let me know. Uh, but yeah, I should just go screenshot a bunch of that stuff. Right, what's this? Eparch spies in the area. Discover and eliminate his spies. Speak with Felix to adjust the heart of the obscure and discover hidden... We've left the area. Enemies. The one other thing that the game does still do when you're playing this normal stuff is learning the nuance of an event. That is something you do. You, 
you, you do actually interact with. Oh, what do I do? I dash through the fruits to drop them on the floor to then throw them in? Okay, you know. And what do we do here? Oh, I think we just kill spice. Well, that's not so fun, is it? Right, let's learn how this staff's working. Auto-chain. Inspiring well, so it's a regen. The burst is path to victory. Car the path to victory, dealing damage, and this was a, a charge, wasn't it? Weakness, heal, and grant regen. With no healing power, I give almost none. We should probably play Celestial for this, actually. Because then we have a bit of healing power. But mind you, it doesn't have any Condi, so... Yeah. Alright, what else we got? I did like this. This was basically one of my favourite weapons. Leap to the target location. Empower allies with fury and might. Gain adrenaline if I actually affected an ally. How much adrenaline? Some adrenaline. Oh my god, there's so much movement here. Charge to the target location. When you arrive, give Prot and Aegis. Heal them. And apply weakness. Oh, there's, there's a lot of weakness. Weakness on F1. Weakness on the three. Oh, I do, I do like giving Aegis as a warrior. That feels cool. I suppose I could run this with um, the heal on burst as well. Holy shit, 8k? That wasn't bad. That was just a spider. What have we got here? Quickly snap your staff to pull enemies in and make them vulnerable. Yeah, I saw this a second ago as I was failing a minute ago. So, how much defiance do we have? This is the only thing that will do a bit of break bar damage so far. Aside from the weakness degen. Five, five, six. I mean, it's okay. Okay, and the five. Focus your mind on the battle. Block incoming attacks after activating this skill. Defiant Raw becomes available for a short duration. And the more blocks empowers Defiant Raw. Defiant Raw is unleash a Defiant Raw. Healing allies, granting them resolution. I couldn't read the tooltip in time. When we get out of combat, we'll see both tooltips. So we can pull him in to keep the CCs going. Nice. It's weird. I'm expecting the F1 to CC and it so doesn't. It's basically Hammer 3, right? But on as a burst instead. So let's absorb some attacks. Okay, it's just a big heal, basically. Oh, I like the uh, ground tail as well on the 3. That was pretty good. Sorry, on the 4. The pull in. Oh, come on. That fucking full count. That's, the full counter always does that. I'm glad you guys saw that because that's, that's the PvE experience for me. I did my Ice Breed Saga strikes on this character yesterday. And, uh, like, the easy five. And I kept trying to gamble on quick little full counters that, you know, would ultimately give me more bursts and would be really fun. And, like, so many of them failed. It was just brutal. Staff Warrior Spellbreaker is so much fun. Fun. You run Staff and Dagger Dagger as well. I love Dagger offhand. It's never really been that great in any format, frankly. But uh, I love I love it so much. Probably just because it's got a Wastrel skill on it and I'm a Mesmer fanboy from the first game. Um, but, you know, that chunks. That, that Dagger 4, if you get it to proc properly, wow. And the 5 is really... I know it's not great, but the 5 is really pretty. And that counts for something. So there we go. The Spy is defeated. Oh, we get a Convergence in 6 minutes. I will show you guys a Convergence, actually. In fact, I could show you this Convergence. Oh, no, no, no. Mm, what should we do? Yeah, let's do a Convergence. Let's do a Convergence. Who should I play on? Uh, we could do it on Hammer, I think. I would play the Condi Herald build that I'm playing in Sarah CM. But it really sucks in the open world because, you know, you stack a bunch of condies and then the thing just dies, you know, and you, it's like, ugh, I was still ramping up. And this build here, playing Celestial Catalyst, um, is just so sturdy, boons for people. It, al it allows me to look at chat. Yeah, okay, so speaking of chat, uh, what do you guys want to talk about? If anyone's got any questions for me, um, I will do my best to respond here. Uh, 
Does this mean we're getting a new no skill challenge soon? No, 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 no only the one. Uh, I'm still very proud of that. I think... Wasn't someone talking about how there was a thread about how the game was too hard and he was playing a ranger the other day? I looked at that and I thought, fuck me, man. Like, you can actually beat the game without pressing any buttons. Like, I've shown it off. You can beat the game. if you Just beat a ranger. That's it. You don't have to press any buttons. And uh, and he was saying, the game. why is the game so hard? I, I, I'm sure that was a bait post. It can't have been real. You find it funny that gameplay treats the heart of the obscure like a Swiss army knife? Oh, like, yeah, okay, and then Mike's saying about the mastery there. Yeah, you just press it and it does anything you want. The Heart of the Obscure and Waiting Sorrow are such interesting parts of the story here because we were talking about the idea of, like, Sutu having a sequel versus not having a sequel. And it feels like it kind of needs one now if if we're ever going to get back to the Heart of the Obscure. You never know, they might leapfrog stories. They could put Waiting Sorrow and the Heart of the Obscure on ice for now. Give it a few years for people to become more interested in the idea of returning to it, and then sell an expansion on it later. WP, did you find and read the note on stream that references Deldramore? I know you talked about it not being a part of the story after the first playthrough. If not, it's near the Hungry Quag and Cryptus. It's like a weathered note or something. No, I didn't read anything about De uh, Deldramore. What's that? That sounds amazing. There's a there's a discussion about the, the Deldramore dwarves in there, is there? Uh, if you guys want to do this with me, by the way, you're more than welcome to. I am on EU, not NA right now. Because the uh, Spud Raid group is EU. So, uh, I'll you just type slash squad join list and you can join. I'm just going to run on in and then we'll see where we get. So, what exactly is the secret of the obscure? <laughs> I don't know. Where is Waiting Sorrow? I mean, the thing is, to give the writers some credit, I think they have been teasing that something weird is going on with that device like and even in this most recent patch isn't there a moment where the demons seem to know more about what it does than we do I, and i think i think there is i i would like to believe that there's a bigger more connected story about epoch and the heart of the obscure and all that i i really i do think that they they're doing something i don't know what exactly and that's the thing like we're ignorant of the whole story right now it's kind of really unfair and really fucked up to like do these massive story reviews already when it's not finished they might redeem it you know but then what i would say is that's a criticism of the format then you know this is the world we're in with mini x facts we're not telling a story all at once we're trickling it out let's see how that felt to play through you know and if it didn't feel good to play through in the time then that's totally fair it's about some stone summit being baited by a Massar. Really? Now that's interesting. Scott Cossage is here in chat. I do think Waiting Sorry Sorry will be safe for a future far Shiver Peak expansion, especially if they tie Worm and Frode's backstory to it. Maybe Nofatsu and the Vatia return? <laughs> People are so obsessed with Nofatsu. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe. They're all things that could be done in like the far, far Shiver Peaks, you mean? Like, we shouldn't even really call it the Far Shiver Peaks, should we? Far Shiver Peaks would mean where the Norn are from. What we're talking about now probably is where the Coden are from, which is like the Arctic. The Tyrian Arctic. <clears throat> Sab has a more developed story. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> Let's be real. That's not true. Unless, you know, that's just tee hee funny joke. WP nostalgic for that first year of the game? I am, actually, yeah. You know, as more and more time goes by... Now, what was I looking at? Something about sound effects. I can't remember what it was. I was looking at this thing where it was like there were all these different sound effects for different possible race profession combos in the game like just some cool detail but it's like it's detail you don't really notice or care about after a certain point when everything you do is massive zergs with events that small scale solo exploration my first time in Kessex style experience my first time in Queensdale my first time in Ratsum you know the, these these kinds of actual initial RPG adventure exploration phases with the game I love all that stuff and Guild Wars was a master Guild Wars 2 was a master it did really 
really well. Incredibly well polished, seamless, brilliant leveling experience. Yes, it's got its issues. Yes, the core story has problems. Yeah, we could go on and on, on about it. But it's good, fun, you know. All right, so here we go. The convergence has opened. And I'm not going to be able to speak because Zodja's going to be in there. And I'm going to I'm gonna let her speak because we haven't heard this dialogue yet in the streams. So here we go. Uh, just join and then right-click join on me, guys. Oh, she's not speaking just yet. Yeah, anyway, I think this game's really good with the leveling. And um, I really think as time's gone on, with all the failings of how irregularly stuff like Ceresium comes out and how disconnected I feel from some of this story and that, I really wish that Guild Wars had focused more on like this idea of being a re-leveling game. A game where it's okay, even after a thousand hours, you get some value from making a new character and playing through the adventure. Where there's some difference and diversity and fun and exploration to be had. Because there's a lot of small scale stories there. Earlier game crafting recipes. Earlier game story missions. Solo stuff that is really good. And just that thrill of leveling and curating a build as you level. Obviously it's the game currently stands. That's not fun to do at all. But what I'm talking about is if over the past five, six, seven years the devs had put effort into initiatives about stuff like that. You know, a bit like how ARPGs work. How you can always just spin up a new character in Path of Exile and try a new build and you'll have some fun. I'm not saying turn I'm not saying dramatically change Guild Wars into a different genre. But I really think there's so much untapped potential and fun uh, in this game, in all of that, and it's all just a wasteland. It's all just a graveyard of nothingness because what we've been doing instead is chasing patches like these. And I don't know, especially with the idea that an Unreal Engine game's gonna come out one day and maybe Sunset Guild Wars one day. Six mini X packs down the line, five down the line, whatever it is. Portal in All that kind of infrastructure would have made Guild Wars evergreen. I need to focus and on it's maintaining not there. our tether to Tyria. The nearest waypoint is a little out of range, so reviving will be a challenge. Luckily, Mabon taught me a few tricks. Resurrection spells take a lot of magic. The best source of that here is going to be the essence that Eparch's grunts drop. Bring that essence to me, and I'll do the rest. Okay, so this is this expansion's Dragon Storm. I don't know what it's like to actually do if this in a 10-man like squad, if you can go real quick. I'll try to pull us back to Tyria. Hopefully, we'll make it back in time for tea. So, oh wow, Zodger's... Oh no, that's not Zodger, there's a Herald somewhere. So basically, here's the, here's the game. It says Heroes Alive 50, that's us, that's the players, 50 of us. And then it says Siege Engines Active. It's got a special designation there on the meta uh, text. But honestly, the Siege I've never seen do anything ever in these. People just break them and that's it. There's an achievement for breaking them. I actually have all of the Convergence achievements done now. Uh, let's see, Secret of the Obscure, Convergences. I keep losing my concentration. Break those catapults to pieces. Except this one, which requires 100 of them. I've done 16. Um... So, yeah, basically, you kill the siege engines to stop them sieging you. In the meantime, Zodja here, Zodja has a health bar. If Zodja dies in this, you all get kicked out. I've never experienced that. Pretty sure that's the case, though, right? I've never actually experienced being kicked out. What's my food right now? Okay. Um, but so you've got to keep her alive, and mobs are constantly charging at her from three angles. Like, there's these guys come, and then some guys over here come, and these guys come. You see these, these avatars of spite? They spawn with the crosses. So you want to leave some people here at Zodja always, just defending these. Now when you kill enemies here, they drop these orbs. And when you pick an orb up, you lose some max health. You see I'm minus 218, 219 max health. But you gain uh, a bit of concentration, a bit of power, and a bit of condition damage per stack. That's not percent modifiers, so it's actually not that great. But uh, one of the masteries is to double the, the, the stack count of these. So you can go up to 50 stacks. So basically, you can half your health. So it's like everyone's a harbinger in here, basically. Now, if you ever go down the state, you lose all of the orbs. So your, your max health returns. It's kind of a reverse death penalty sort of experience there. Um, so the idea is as you fight, you collect loads and loads of orbs. And that means you'll be able to do big, big, big DPS. But you're very vulnerable. And, I can um, feel the demonic essence in those high cryptus. And you Take know that's down, the game really. And I can throw that power back in their face. If you Quite are enough, and I might even be able to cast some additional protections. Be careful though. Demonic essence will drain your life force. Plus there is that whole possession thing to worry about. I don't know what she's talking I, I would I don't know what she means with possession. If you're a low vitality character so Ellie thief guardian 
Uh, you will have really low health here, and you will die to a lot of stuff, so I don't actually know whether it's really recommended to even play those classes here. Like, you just get, they're just nerfed compared to the other classes, frankly. It feels very different to play like a warrior here, or a necro. You can easily be at the 50 stacks, and you have more than enough health cushion to survive the nukes, and then other people will heal you up. So, uh, yeah. I don't really know what else there is to say with that, to be honest. Um, just lets you do some damage. And it's kind of fun when people get nuked, you see all of the orbs just pop out all over the place. Man, I found it so hard to talk and play Catalyst at the same time as well. My achievement order is all fucked up here. Uh, so beyond that, then you can see it says that there's uh, islands. Or it should say that there's islands somewhere. So basically, um, in each corner of the map, I guess we're in the center first. There's probably a central phase that I didn't realize. Uh, basically, you spread out, and there's like five champions in each island. So I don't know how efficiently you can run out and go and kill all the things. Like Dragonstorm, if you take a private squad in to do Dragonstorm, you can clear it really fucking fast. I don't know about this one. You kill all of them, and then there'll be a final boss. And the final boss is random. And they added a new random one with the last patch. And I would assume next patch they'll do it again. See here, these avatars of spite. You want to kill these, because these are basically bum-rushing Zodger. And that's not something you want. I fucked that up there. Get my water sphere. More high cryptus! Oh, damn it, Epoch. Spread out to defeat them. Maybe we can lure out whoever's pulling their strings. I hope you guys can hear the game. I'm trying side chain ducking today, by the way. Is that been Let obvious to you? What well, that means is when I'm speaking, the game volume drops a little bit. And then when I stop speaking, it should come back up. I don't know if it's too subtle or too loud or whatever. Wow, Banjo, you're on your 100th convergence. Are you serious? Holy shit. I mean, it's going to take me a I don't doubt I'll get it. To me, it's a bit like the Auric Basin. Hundreds. Clears achievement, you know. I don't see anything wrong with it. Some people say, oh, that's so grindy, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I'd rather have something to do than not have something to do. Oh, I fucked that up as well. Good stuff. Um, that's it really, I think. <laughs> I mean, there's bits where you fly around on the sky scale to get around. I don't know what boss we'll have. Might be one of the new ones. It would be quite cool if it was one of the new ones. These guys are fucking brutal because they'll just rip all your boots. It's pretty nasty. I do like having two stun breaks on here though, for that. So yeah, there you go. Islands cleared. Zero and four. Siege engines up. So each island is going to have like five bosses. And what you really want to do is spread out. But they are quite deadly. And depending on your build and how much essence you have, you might not be able to solo some of these. For example, I will engage on this guy. I have a tag, so I assume someone might come with me. So here, because we started on the earth, our orbs are kind of fucked. Which is always annoying. Yeah, like, look how much damage I'm taking here. Oh, and they often have bounty mechanics as well. Which I always like to see, because I, I quite like the bounty mechanics. Unless we do it like this, maybe? Yeah, we had to skip the earth one. Yeah, I'm going to go down here. This is rough. Oh, well, mind you, I've aggroed two of the fucking things. I'm going to elite in here just to keep my health up. Never mind, they interrupted it, so it was not a waste. Because we're leaving the achievement anyway. No endurance. Come on, give me a big AoE on that. Okay, I'm going to try and put my water sphere down before I heal. Because then we get the combo finisher. Combo finisher and tag a bunch of the bosses all at once. It's about as much value as you can get out of Arcane Brilliance on a catalyst. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know. How many players have we got? Okay, so yeah, there's this mechanic. When you get defeated, that's what I, I thought a second ago that I was uh, forgetting something. So basically, um, it's got Zodger Essence, Essence for Resurrection spell here. To me. This is kind of brutal. Zodger's getting battered. We can kill the islands. I've never seen a, a Convergence struggle this much. So basically, you bring those orbs to Zodger, and it fills up this secondary bar. She's dying. Is anybody even over there? There's a dead guy over there. But this is going to wipe. <laughs> oh my god. Oh no, people are moving in. 
That's crazy. Um, yeah, so you bring the orbs in, and it gives... Uh, and when it fills up, she will revive people. There is no natural way to revive in it. And I love this mechanic. I think it's really cool. I think it's awesome that I can... I got all the bars for the flying. I think it's cool that I've got, you know, fun little abilities. I feel like all this shit could have easily been a mastery, but since it's only getting the applied in the convergence... Fun. I mean, there are masteries that affect this stuff as well. So there you go. The bar filled up, and she revived me and everyone. So now it says Heroes Live 50 again. And I'm going to go back to that island. And hope that they're going to heal her. Or maybe I shouldn't. The thing is, I spend all my time just sitting there grinding away. I want to give you guys some different footage. Being in a squad kind of helps me see... Like, no one's down there. Alright, I'll fight this and then I'll go to that other one. That's weird, really weird. Someone in map chat saying, please write and tell people if you need more help at Zodja. You can see if they need more help by her health bar. Yeah. <laughs> Man, and look at this chat here. There's something wrong with this community nowadays. I don't know. Maybe there's always been something wrong with it. Any kind of meta thing where you have to cooperate with strangers, people get so fucking snarky and rude and just... You know, I get boisterously, like, in a fun way snarky on these streams. But I would never, like, randomly in a chat just start, you know, talking shit like that to people. It's just crazy. Not that they're even being particularly bad. You guys know what it's like at Taria and so I fucked it up again. I've got to find a moment here. It sort of sucks. Soloing really nasty champions on builds that aren't made to solo really nasty champions. While I also want to look at chat, it's not easy. I, got, I have one player over there. I can use my Jade bot. All right, there you go. That's one island done somewhere. <clears throat> Apparently, I tagged credit. I'm gonna cleanse all that condi there. Fucking hell. I'm not actually in the puddle, and yet I'm getting condi to death. I'm not in the puddle! What's he condiing me with? How many players we got? Two. Maybe I can rally on this one. And so, as you can see, like here as well, um, we had to land the four there. He was leaping at me, and I didn't like the look of it. Oh, he went down. I'm not sure I get him up. Yeah, uh, you can see here, if you are, um, you're collecting a bunch of essence and then you're going to go solo some of the champs, yeah, be prepared to struggle. Uh, it's probably more efficient to do this one first. And of course they went the other way. Oh no, I do have a player. I like that combo there. You have the big, uh, you have the big ground tail in the middle, forcing you out, which makes you more vulnerable to the wall, which you can't really escape when you're far away. That wall, of course, showing up a lot in Sarah CM. Where we currently are in our prog for Sarah CM is when those walls start getting doubled. So kind of early in the fight, sort of the start of the middle of the fight, really. And uh, we haven't like gone through how to deal with it just yet. Because again, we're just trying to get there with zero stacks, you know, just taking it one bit at a time. And um, yeah, it's pretty chaotic. We're nearly just resigning to GG anyway, but you know, we'll see it. It's just like insane. It's such a shame we have to wait till Sunday to do it again. He's dead. Sarah CM mechanic and everyone. Actually, they use that wall everywhere. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, uh, when I did the story of this patch, he sort of said, you know, it's a shame because you would think that... 
only Ceres should use that wall. And it shouldn't really appear anywhere else. You know, that's Ceres' special thing. The Relic of Ceres has that, you know. And then, unfortunately, the, the devs just use it everywhere. Because, you know, they don't really have the resources for a billion different things. So, <laughs> you tend to see the same combat ideas being recycled. I mean, it itself is just Sabbath's flame wall. Let's be real, right? I'm going to be able to reprop that. That's annoying. The last island? I just foolishly assumed it was all done already. It's not. We're gonna do this last boss. Mind you, the green tag's already there. Okay, so with this done, and how long has this taken us so far? This has taken us about 10 minutes. Um, a little bit over 13 minutes, something. I think a lot of groups can get this done in about 10. It all depends on how efficient it is. Well, it kind of is a thing is people rush the opening convergence door. Oh, I should have done it the other way. No, it worked anyway. Oh yeah, and as you complete these repeatables, you keep getting nuggets of essence. And then the nuggets of essence, as we saw in the previous part. I... Oh, focus. We need to focus. Wherever the hell they are. I'll keep They're it in inventory somewhere. You they give you a bunch of the essences. But... Okay, so here we go. So this is Oja. Telling us about the boss. And we got the Dreadwing. I think Dreadwing is new. So there is a bit of risk of Zodja dying at the end, and this is it once this thing dies. But it's going to move every 25% to a different like corner of the map. Um, man, I do like that in combat sky scale, man. It's so good. There is a bit of risk that some of these bosses will blow Zodja up. Like she actually moves to the boss now. She doesn't just stay in the middle of the map. She moves to the boss. So what do I want to do here? I think I have the energy for it. Oh, don't know. Okay. Lose a bunch of energy there. That was weird. Did you guys see that? Down behind. I so could have contributed to that break bar and just did none. <laughs> I was in air and everything. We wounded it. Keep up. Ah, uh, there you go. And so then he faced. That's a shame. I was getting ready for the big double fire there. Cool. Um, yeah. So then he phases. And you can collect orbs from the people who died. Or maybe he dropped these. I don't know, actually, whether that's from Downstates. Or the boss himself drops it at phase. And so you see he was here, and now he's going to be here. And then Leo will be there, and then Leo will be there. And that's it. And it is funny, you know, I've done, what, what is it, 14 of these now? I feel it's it's weird, because I felt like Zodja was barely in this expansion. Like, barely. But now that I've been doing these, and she's in the farm content, I feel like Zodge is in the expansion a lot, because I'm constantly hearing her talk away. And it's weird as well, when I hear her voice, it does get me a bit nostalgic for the game of old. Started in air again. I'm always tempted to do that, and it's always annoying. Well, actually, it won't be that annoying here. Oh, no, fuck that. What I can do is this. to skip fire there, the fire sphere, because we shouldn't have used earth earlier. I'm trying to pair them off. So you see earth and fire together. Grand finale. And then we just wait here with a few autos to get the energy up enough to do fire again. Fire and earth again. Stay for that. Behind him. Uh. Obviously, this build for like lots of damage could be a lot better in terms of like if I had the 
utilities on. But I do prefer the stun ropes. But we can't let it escape. But open world. And it's only celestial gear anyway. He drops orbs every 10%. Oh, is that what's happening? I always assumed it was that people were dying or getting hit by the abilities. And that's where the orbs were getting dropped from. But it's not that, is it? Ah. How is the Dreadwing Hell Sister can be tough? Yeah, it's funny, actually. The first day this patch came out, I got the Hell Sister. The very first conver convergence, right as this happened. And um, she was really weird because she has the eyeball mechanic above her head constantly. So I thought, oh, you have to look away. But I just didn't look away. And, like, it was fine. So I don't really know what the deal was with, with that. She just seemed to have, like, a cone attack, right? And, um... And I just kind of, you know, stepped behind her. You see where she's facing. And you stand behind her. And then that's it. That's, that's the whole fight, it seems to be. It's a shame. Even with Celestial Gear, when he's below 50% health, which he is now, you can often see each what each tick of the uh, the grand finale hitting for 10k, 11k actually I've seen as well. But we're not really getting up there here. And that's without the fire augment. But we're only getting the 8k at the moment. Here we go. I'll contribute for once. There you go, everybody. See, I'm a good guy. I help with the break bar. Is that enough for water? Just. I'm staying. I don't think you're actually meant to stay for water fight. Oh, I fucked this up as well. What the fuck? Why did I already... Why did I not have fire up already? Ugh. See, that's always the worst. You bring a stun break on your build. You prop it. You, you press it promptly. And then only only to just get immediately CC'd again a second later because of some kind of charge or something. It's like, wow. Not only have I wasted the button, but I've wasted the entire skin as well. I may as well not have been there. Okay. I kind of feel like I should have just stayed on Warrior and played with staff here. I wouldn't have really been doing very much. What I can try to do is set up an actual build with some healing power and stuff, but I don't know. We've got a lot of weapons to get through. Starting fire. Oh, God. Yeah, what CC'd me? We were pretty clearly behind him. No? I felt like we were. I probably shouldn't have used that arcane shield there. That was done. Just felt like something was coming and I wanted to block it. Defend yeah, like yourself. That. that was someone else giving me Aegis. But at least that's a few less of Epark's grunts clawing at our feet. Let's head back home. It's basically the Wyvern Matriarch or Patriarch again, but without the cool break bar phase where they're flying off. And uh, yeah, you get a bonus chest. So the more weekly, so the, the whole mechanic here, and I, you guys probably know this, but whatever. Look, under the convergence section, it has weeklies, okay? So they're saying to you, do three a week. That's That's it. They pop every three hours, just do three a week, which isn't that bad. But basically, the first one you do gives you a free motivation, which is like seven gold. And then it's these boxes, these convergence extractions. The second one gives you one. This gives you two. So you get double the rewards. And they're, they're quite a lot of stuff. Like, look at these. These three boxes, this is from doing my weeklies. Ready? So when I open, we just get absolutely crazy amounts of these currencies, which are obviously the main gates for the legendary armor. So you just do three convergences a week. And what did that take us? That was a pretty inoptimal map or whatever. It took us, what, 20 minutes, 25 minutes tops? And there you go. And you get a slightly different boss each time. It's it's the dragon storm of this expansion. There's, there's really not much else to say. And there you go. That's just the regular reward as well. 
And uh, Zodja stays in there. And it's it's weird to think that Zodja not, might just be there forever. <laughs> you know, so That's another thing about the story as well. I was really interested in all that interesting ethical stuff going on with Zodja's ascension. And then it sort of happened off screen. And it felt a bit weird. There you go. Okay, so um, I think that's going to be it, guys. So thank you very much for tuning in uh, today, Secrets of the Obscure. Uh, I will be back with more. And uh, we'll just keep going. I don't know, actually. Look, this idea of doing all the weapons... Drop me some YouTube comments if you're actually interested in seeing all the weapons. Because what occurs to me now is I'm going to have to like play nine characters. Ugh, I, I don't know if I can be bothered. I really don't know. I mean, in theory, off screen, I could go through. I could get all the characters, get all the weapons, set up builds for them, and do like spotlights at the start of every stream we do. That would probably be quality content. At the same time, it's a time investment that I'd rather just put into the thing I'm currently let's play. So I don't know. If you really want that, let me know. Otherwise, we'll just continue with the story here. We made zero progress to the story on this. Zero progress. Oh, uh, I've got some more um, essence as well here. Let's see what we can buy. Man, have you guys noticed this? The Wizard's Vault lags so bad for me now. Look at this. Get boots. Boots and I actually still need to record um, a couple more adventures. We've kept saying we're going to meet up again, we're going to meet up again, we're going to meet up again. But the last time we met up, I don't even know. What was the last adventure? Have you guys seen me doing an adventure with him? A turtle adventure? Has that gone up? Because we played for like five hours straight together. Just like needling each other about the best strategy to beat this thing co-op to get, well, uh, to get number one. We just went on and on and on and on and on. And then eventually he was like, oh, fuck, I've got to go. <laughs> and that was it. And I'm kind of not look looking forward to having that same experience again because we did kind of just lose a day there. <laughs> I mean, it was fun. Um, all right, let's get the Sky Sage's boots. Ooh, and the Sky Sage's gloves. Ooh, and now we're out of money. And I'll get the helm at some point and we'll wear them all together. And then we need some more of these already got a bunch. I noticed they're doing something really cool with the UI on these, where when when you open the subsequent boxes, you the options you already have unlocked are removed from the list completely, so you cannot mess it up. It's pretty good. Eshaman says, thanks for the stream with $10. Thank you, man. That's really good of you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I very much appreciate you guys who came to check out the live chat. I feel very weird about these ones because, you know, they're kind of negative and all that kind of shit. I don't know. But at the end of the day, content so, uh, thank you very much for watching, guys. Careful I hope you enjoyed. Now. Have a great uh, evening. Sure how and uh, the next thing you see from me will be the next episode of Tomb Raider, which is the end of the story. So, if you've been curious about how that game concludes, if you remember the whole way through that Let's Play, I've been saying that I'm not really a fan and I didn't like the ending. Well, the ending is the next one. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and more, more cool stuff to come. So, thank you, everybody. I, I really appreciate it. And I will see you on the uh, the next one very soon. Oh, I'll tell you what. We can end as well with Mr. Modius' login screen again. Uh, oh, yeah. And by the way, if you do drop YouTube comments, I will screenshot them again. We'll do a bit of a Q&A se section again on the next one. Because I thought that was quite fun today, wasn't it? So, yeah. Uh, have a good one, guys. Bye-bye.
All right, yeah. I, I don't know why you guys watched the whole way through that, but yeah, really good, right? Oh, no, I just kind of sneered at it. I, it's really good. <laughs> don't get me wrong, but of course, that was the outro. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Uh, and remember, Mr. Modi has made that. It's on WP2. I'll see you guys next time.